God of War Ragnarok is a highly anticipated sequel to God of War 2018, a game that has been cherished by most and considered by many to be the greatest game of the PS4 era. Now, I'm not gonna give my opinion on that since the topic is divisive, but nonetheless, it is easy to see why this game is so highly anticipated. This game has been praised like crazy, most outlets giving it a 10 out of 10, so in this video, I would like to critique the game and see if it lives up to that kind of hype. So strap in, grab some popcorn, subscribe to the channel, and click that bell icon, and don't forget to go follow the Twitch that is down in the description. This video is going to be a long one, so if you need to take breaks and or find a section you want to look at first, last, and so forth, timestamps will also be in the description if need be. Keep in mind this is full spoilers, so turn away if you haven't played the game. Now with this quick intro out of the way, let's dive in. We start off with Kratos looking at the small satchel that carried Faye's ashes, which is his wife, if you guys remember. The scene tells us that he absolutely misses her. Still thinking about her, he then puts away the satchel and starts making some arrows for Atreus, his son. Eventually, Atreus comes out of the fog and brings in a deer, asking Kratos if he is hungry. Kratos doesn't say anything, but tells his son that they are heading home. This man is still grumpy, mumbled old man from the previous games, but you can tell he's a bit softer. At least to his son that is. He picks up the deer and brings it to the cart that is being pulled by a couple of wolves. Bro, why are these wolves so cute? <laughs> I have no idea, but if they die during the game, I'm gonna be pissed. Afterwards, we see Atreus looking at something that is important to him, an orb of some sort. When Kratos comes up behind him, he gets scared and puts it away, indicating that he's hiding it from him. I wonder why. Eventually, while traversing through the snow, we hear the screech of a falcon, something that the two should be worried about. Atreus asks if it's her, making me think at least the time it could be Freya. Freya is the mother of Baldur, in which we capped his ass in the previous game. Game. This means that she isn't exactly our friend anymore. Then we see her in front of us. Within the first couple minutes of the game, things get real. Freya then comes barreling at us while Kratos accelerates the cart that glides through the snow. Freya pulls her sword out, angry as hell, trying to get to Kratos. A quick time event hits, throwing Freya on top of us. What kind of surprised me was that Kratos wasn't going after her. He doesn't want to kill her. He's simply trying to avoid. After playing the game through its entirety, it makes sense. Why would Kratos want to kill her? He has been through everything. He feels for her. Shortly after, she comes back around socking the shit out of Kratos, sending his face into the snow. I felt that through my headset and controller. <laughs> we get our bearings though and get back to trying to flee her. This whole section is crazy. Shit is flying, everything is high action. All of this at the beginning of the game, this is how you start a sequel. Get the player directly into it. After a couple of minutes of fleeing and quick time events, we finally evade Freya with her laying in the snow screaming Kratos' name. That shit was a bloody murder scream. It reminds me of when I was a kid and forgot to take off the garbage so my mom got mad at me. Kratos and Atreus talk about what just happened, about how Kratos killed her son, and that she won't stop until Kratos is dead. Shortly after, Atreus mentions Fimble Winter. A winter that happens before the beginning of Ragnarok. He says that the winter really started to come down after the death of Baldur, which in this lore is what sparks the happening of Ragnarok. When they finally get to a point where they stop, they get off the cart, tell the wolves to get in their pen, and off they go. What I found pretty cute about this was when Kratos said that he will get the deer, but when he turns around, Atreus, or Atreus already has it in his arms. You see a smirk on Kratos' face, indicating that he's proud of his son. This shit makes me smile so much. Later though, things get emotional and it's about Fenrir, Atreus' other pet wolf. He mentions he usually comes and greets him when they get back. I'm going to let this scene play out and I dare you to try not to cry. I sure as hell failed that challenge. Also, this scene shows the relationship between the two so far. It also looks deep into the mind of Kratos, so to speak. Come on, boy. You need to eat. Eat. Why? Too big? <laughs> there you go. Good boy. Atreus, the time draws near. You must prepare yourself. For what? He's still eating. He wants to live. He is dying. You're a good boy. A 
brave boy. Fast and strong. But you can rest now. Okay? I'll be okay. You can let go now. You have to let go. Sofna. Afra. Esu. Sofna. Hethon. Sofna. 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 No. It's the middle of the night. Night does not stop our enemies. Why? What for? Drinking is all we ever do. Ever. It's not enough. We can't hide forever. Time is running out. The prophecies say Fimblewinter leads to Ragnarok. War is coming. Whatever Loki's supposed to be doing, he's supposed to be doing it now. My story doesn't end hiding in these woods. I should be out there, finding out who I am, who Loki is. I will not allow you to pick a fight with gods. I don't want to fight anyone. I just want answers. And if those answers lead to war with Asgard? Maybe that's what Mother wanted. We do not know what Mother wanted. Looks like we never will. Look. I have a moment alone with Fenrir before I bury him. Well, I recognize that dour expression anywhere. Care to tell me what went wrong? The wolf is gone. Oh, no. Not Fenrir. How's the lad taking it? Not well. He goes to bury him. Oh, damn it. All right, brother. Good night, then.
Kratos? Are you joining me? Before we jump into the dream with Faye, let's go over what we witnessed with Kratos and Atreus. I mentioned I was gonna be pissed if the wolf died. Well, <laughs> it fucking happened within the first, like, couple minutes of the game, so let's just put that aside. Atreus is clearly distraught over the death of Fenrir. You could tell that this boy loves the wolf and is attached to it. If you know enough about Norse lore, Fenrir is Loki's son. This is kind of a subtle hint of what is to come in the game. It's not necessarily a huge plot point, but later down the line you will understand what I'm talking about. What is important though is that Kratos is trying to distract Atreus. While growing up, Kratos was the type of person to train when something is on his mind, whether that be pain, loss, or something else entirely. This brings into question the difference between the two. Atreus isn't Kratos. He's more attached to things such as people and especially animals considering he can understand what they're saying. One of Loki's powers is to be able to understand animal thoughts. Like I said, Kratos knows this, so in a way to take his mind off things, he offers to train. Kratos means well, but in the end it isn't what Atreus wants. It isn't what any of us would want. People have a different way of grieving. Atreus just wants time with Fenrir. Kratos, during the conversation, understands this and lets Atreus spend time with Fenrir before he gets buried. After Kratos falls asleep, he wakes up in a dream greeted by his late wife, Faye. This whole section is pretty beautiful and colorful. It is a nice change considering Fimblewinter makes everything white and gray. This whole dream literally is about chasing a wolf and helping Faye when she asks. Eventually, we get to a part where we have to help Faye lift up a lot because apparently she can't do it herself. <laughs> Isn't she like a giant? Aren't they strong and shit? But we believe in chivalry here, so we do it anyway. When we do so, she calls us good boy. So Santa Monica knew what they were doing here. My little 5'4'S literally said yes mommy to the screen. So what has social media done to me? I, I, I don't know. We eventually get to the wolf, but when we do, Faye isn't around. When this happens, Kratos flips out and yells out her name a couple of times. She then scares the ever leaving crap out of me, coming from behind and tells us that time is running out and there is much to do. She takes out her yellow hand and puts it on Kratos' head and wakes us up from our dream. When we awake, Mir, the head dude, calls out her name, worried. But Mamir states that he doesn't know, which is why he was calling out for him. Trace never came back from burying Fenrir, and this sends us on a quest to find him. After some walking, we come across an arena of enemies. These are usually scattered among the world in plentiful numbers. As always, I will talk about combat towards the end of the video. The reason being is because I feel more comfortable talking about story details rather than gameplay. I don't know why, it's just the way it is. But after we defeat said enemies, Mamir tells us that it isn't normal for the raiders to be this close to the protection stave that the two have put up. Indicating that something is happening, whether that be the coming of Ragnarok, it could be Freya doing these things, but regardless, we keep pushing forward. Along the way, we find a trail of blood. At the worst, this could be Atreus, or it could be an animal of some kind. Regardless, we still push forward. As the journey continues, Mimir and Kratos talk about the prophecy that was indicated on the wall at the end of the first game. Kratos says that he doesn't believe in prophecies, but still wants to train Atreus anyways, because he's afraid if he does die, Atreus won't be able to survive on his own. Now, I like these conversations within the game, giving you insight on what is going on in the world or what happened between the end of the first game and now. Now, it is almost impossible to cover every single conversation within the game, so I will try my best to cover some of the more interesting ones. We get to a point where Mimir tells us that Atreus may have been chasing an injured bear trying to help it, so this solidifies the point that the blood we were trailing was possibly from an animal. We then get to a cutscene where Kratos calls for Atreus, but a bear comes barreling out of nowhere and attacks us. After beating the shit out of it and just totally annihilating the boss fight, the bear starts transforming and ends up being Atreus. At this point, I was just as surprised as Kratos. Atreus being a bear? That shit is so badass. I was hoping they would use this as a gameplay mechanic later down the line, and spoiler alert, they do. <laughs> Kratos, being a good dad, tries to calm down Atreus. He asks him what exactly happened, but Atreus doesn't know. He does tell us, though, that he was angry, which is possibly what triggered the transformation. He tells us that a bear started charging after him, but he charged back. After that, he doesn't remember anything. The two end up getting in an argument, though. 
Kratos says that they really need to train now to learn the reach of Atreus' abilities, but the boy has none of it. All he says is that he wants answers. It's understandable to be honest, I would want answers as well. The curiosity would kill me, especially since the destruction of Asgard is near. You would of course want to know what the fuck's gonna happen. And I love the questions in this game, especially through the eyes of Atreus, and more will come later in the game. Kratos then has a heart-to-heart -heart moment with Atreus, telling him that he would have killed him, which pushes the fact that there's even more of an urgency to train and control his emotions out of all people. Kratos recognizes this. Kratos has struggled with his emotions for so long, and if you let it boil long enough, it'll turn to rage and revenge. But Atreus fires back and says the inaction is also a risk, something that his father had told him. Atreus then says that he needs to stop thinking like a father and more like a general, and this gets Kratos pissed, and for good reason. Kratos has left the life behind and will not go back to it at any cost, well, at least for the moment. You feel for both of these characters, they both have good points, and you don't really know who to side with. This is a good thing in games, asking questions early on is a good way for the player to be even more engaged with the story. But eventually we come across Atreus's rampage. You see a dead bear with its cubs nearby. This is a sad scene. This reiterates that Atreus's actions have consequences within the world. This is a rhetoric that you will see throughout the game. Establishing it early on is a sign that you need to keep an eye on it. I'm not gonna lie though, my eyes were watering during the scene. I hate seeing animals in pain or being alone. I'm just a compassionate person. We eventually get to the house, but before anything, Atreus stops by his wolves and checks on them. I found this important because throughout the game, you'll come to realize that this love for animals either helps out during the game, like in Atreus's point of view, but also can cause damage to the world. Also, towards the end of the game, it is important as well, and of course, I'll touch on it when it, the time comes. So when we get to the house and we awake from our nap, sleep, whatever you want to call it, the same cutscene that plays at the end of the first game plays here now with Thor coming into the house. But instead of a fight breaking out, Thor just wants to come in and talk. He then says to Kratos, are you a calm and reasonable person? And Kratos, of course, agrees when the moment calls for calm, he is going to be calm. But then all of a sudden we hear a knock on the door. It's Odin. But as you can see, Odin isn't exactly what you were expecting. And honestly, I think that's a good thing. We don't need another traditional bad guy that is a total jerk to everyone around him. Now, yeah, Odin is still an asshole, but he adds charisma to it. He adds humor, and then you add humor to a character that is bad, it will no longer make them one-dimensional. This goes for Thor, but in a different light. Thor, you could tell, is an alcoholic. He literally has a drink with him when he goes into... Kratos' home. This gives the assumption that this man isn't exactly the most stable of people. He could be angry, funny, sad, and have all sorts of emotions. I mean, even Odin says he has more fun when he was a drunk. <laughs> so th this kind of adds to that rhetoric. The one plus about every character in this game is they at least add something else besides their main personality trait, and I love it. Regardless, we find out that Atreus has been looking for Tyr, which is a surprise to Kratos. Kratos now can't trust Atreus considering his mischievous nature is putting them in a vulnerable spot. Speaking on trust, you'll come to find out that this is the main centerpiece of the game. Eventually, a conversation breaks out where Odin asks for peace between Kratos and the Aesir gods, saying if there's any more blood spilled, then of course Odin's going to come after Kratos. But... Odin wants peace for some reason, but after Kratos says no, Thor just snaps his fingers, gets Mjolnir, and rocks Kratos' shit. We get sent into a boss fight, and of course, we whoop his little behind, but what I find the most amazing thing about this is there's a little scene where Thor actually takes you out. At this point, you think... You will have to restart from your checkpoint because you failed, but it was scripted. Thor resurrects you, and you continue to fight. This was so cool because of the surprise factor. I love it when games do this. It just adds a little spice to the mix. During the fight, Thor tries to get a rise out of Kratos, saying he wants to see the real God of War, the God Killer. And surprisingly, you get a glimpse of the old Kratos towards the end. When this happens, Thor stops the fight and tells us he got what he wanted. He got his blood payment. Brock and Sindri, the dwarves from the previous game, come out of nowhere and tells us that we need to follow them, and of course we do so. They tell us that they will get a gateway ready in order to make our way home faster. I'm just gonna say super quick that I love these dwarves, especially Brock, they're just really funny. Brock shit talks so much and Sindri is just a germaphobe wussy. L let me play a clip real quick to show how funny Brock is. Oh yeah? And what's to stop the all fucker from spying on you? 
or raven pecking your house to splinters while you're asleep in it. Nothing, that's what. When we get to the house, we find Atreus and Mimir. Kratos is very worried about his son, which is sweet for a big brawlic war machine. Atreus tells us that Odin invited him to Asgard, which isn't a good thing. Kratos then asks the important question of why Atreus was searching for Tyr in the first place. Atreus says that he wanted to tell Kratos, but if he did, Kratos would have not let him. He brings up a good point to be honest, but at the same time I feel for Kratos. The boy could have gotten into deep trouble. We've already seen that his actions now have caught the attention of the Aesir gods. Atreus then tells us that he wants to show us something since we know his secret. Kratos disagrees in a fit of rage. He slams the door on Atreus and tells him he can't trust him since he broke said trust. Eventually, Atreus convinces Kratos to come and take a look. We pick up the Blades of Chaos and go on our way. Along the way to what Atreus is going to show us, he tells us that Odin told him that he doesn't care about Jotunheim anymore. He says that he can avert Ragnarok another way, which raises some questions. What is the other way? Regardless, we keep pushing forward. When we get closer to the destination, Atreus also tells us that he is what he's leading us to. He mentions the mural that the giants made, the ones that tell the future. He says that there is more to them than we realize. Once we get to that mural, Atreus puts his hand on it, and suddenly the mural vanishes and reveals a gateway. Atreus opens up the door and we go in. And when we're in the mural, it tells the real story of what has happened and will happen, depending on when you see it. The important thing here is that it literally details the entire game during the most important moments. You don't necessarily understand that until you play throughout the whole game. I find it quite cool. I mean, sure, it spoils the game to some degree, but there are still some surprises. Some details within the mural are fuzzy, which was done on purpose. They still keep mystery within the story being told. But like I said, you don't understand that these are spoilers until you've played the full game. We eventually get out of the mural and Atreus shows us some more. It gives us a little marble thing that he has been messing with at the beginning of the game. We will find out exactly what this is later on. Atreus says that he has also been to other shrines and states that he saw Tyr imprisoned. This brings Atreus to ask if we could find him to help and get some answers. We also find out that Sindri has been helping out Atreus, which doesn't surprise me. Sindri's a homie though. The conversation continues and we agree that the best bet to find Tyr would be in Svartalfheim the realm of the dwarves. They think that he is somewhere imprisoned in a mine, but Kratos tells him that they are heading home. You can tell already that Kratos, even though closer to his son, is still a grumpy old man. And of course, he is doing this to protect Treus, but at the same time, you can't delay the inevitable of Ragnarok. Setting this up though is a good thing. It sets up character growth for the both of them. And let me tell you, the payoff is huge in the game. When we get close to home, Amir asks for a word with us. He tells us that we shouldn't hold Atreus' curiosity against him. This prompts Kratos to change his mind when it comes to finding Tyr. He then tells Atreus that we can go look for him, but if they don't find him, they'll come back. Atreus is of course happy about this news, but the one thing I don't like about this is how quick Kratos changed his mind. But at the same time, Kratos thinks of Amir as a brother and values his input, so I guess it makes sense. I just with the, wish that there was a little more pushback here i mean there was some pushback i guess but i just want a tad bit more if you know what i mean things involving gameplay pretty much we eventually get to the house and meet Sindri there there was some funny dialogue here that shows how awkward Sindri is acting like it was his first time seeing atreus in a while Sindri's awkward nature is just so damn funny and i don't know why Sindri tells us that he has a place for us to lay low for a while we head towards the portal in order to do so, and when we come out of the portal, we see Sindri's house. And my god, is it huge. What the hell? Also, let me just gush about how pretty this game is. I know it's hard for you guys to tell considering it's on a YouTube. When we get inside, Sindri's germaphobe looking ass tells Kratos to wipe his feet when he gets in the house. Bro, you literally telling Kratos that? Are you for real? <laughs> of course Kratos doesn't wipe his feet. Who do you think he is? Atreus lays out the details to Sindri on how they are looking for Tyr and seeing how they can travel between realms. Atreus then turns to Sindri because he and Brock are the only ones who know how. Also, I'm going to let this scene play out with Brock because it's hilarious. The best character in the game, just by far. Oh, the Holder brothers finally require the services of the smartest man alive. That's it precisely. Hey! Not so fast. How'd that get in here? What the hell is it anyway? That is my son. Well, what in all yarns me the happen to him? 
He's too damn tall now. And he looks like that. I blame you. Well, come on then. Let's get him something that fits at least. He's just getting older, you daft prat. Didn't you ever have an awkward phase in your youth? Hey. I suppose what's done is done. But you'll be putting your foot down from now on if you know what's good. Oh, he's trying. Believe me. All right, let's gear you fuckers up before you go off gallivant. Soon after, Kratos asks Sindri if there is a way they can unlock the realms in order to travel to Svartalfheim and rescue Tyr. Sindri tells us to follow and to bring Mimir since he is needed. Along the way, Sindri tells us while we are there to talk to Durlin. He believes that he can help us find where Tyr is, though Brock hints that Durlin may not give us what we need. He mentions the, that Durlin isn't exactly the nicest of dwarf folk. Can't be that easy, can it? We find out that Svartalfheim is under Odin's thumb, meaning if we ask for any outside help, we can't expect them to help us. Though I do understand that Odin probably has every realm on high alert, but I do wish that there were some places where it was inhabited by at least some NPCs. You kind of get that with Svartalfheim, but not to the degree of what I would hope. I guess it makes sense. This is a God of War game. These are these games really don't have bustling environments like, like Grand Theft Auto, but only one can wish. The characters make their way outside in order to get to the doorway between realms working. There's this funny as fuck sequence that where they put Mimir into this Bifrost mechanism that shoots into his eyes. The interaction is funny because of the reaction of Brock and Mimir. I'm gonna let it play. Shine this light in your eyes. Oh, oh, Cindy, a stodding bastard! <laughs> Open! Open now! I, I was really hoping not to use the eyelid clamps. Do it! <laughs> oh! That's it! That's it! Good! Now, release! Still unpleasant! Oh, that's our cue! Come on, hurry! I'm coming, I'm coming! Rustle of eggs, man! What was that for? You'll see soon enough. Just adjust. <gasps> there! That should do it! See? No permanent damage. I'll show you permanent damage, you wee fuck! Kratos! Throw me at him! Horns first! <laughs> Case you takes a joke, you old goat! <laughs> After the fact, we go on our journey, Svartalfheim, home of the dwarves. With our journey going into Svartalfheim, you will find that there is a lot to do in this area. This is the first time where the map really opens to you in this game. Of course, this is after the fact you talk to a certain NPC, but regardless, I will say I love the environment of this realm. There is a stark contrast between Svartalfheim and Midgard. Midgard is this beautiful forest taken over by a harsh winter, but in this realm, it is sunny and muggy, the opposite of what you would think Fimble Winter would be like, and I love this a lot. Imagine playing a game where there's a constant snow with the only colors of the game being gray and blue. Now, that wouldn't be too fun, would it? We find out that Fimble Winter does affect this realm, but it does it in a different way. The wildlife is much more hazardous and toxic, while at the same time, more enemies are abundant. As we move forward in the story, we come across a familiar looking dwarf. This dwarf is actually the composer of the game, Bear McCreary. I find this cameo quite cool and wish more games gave roles to their composers like this, especially when the music in this game is as top notch as it can be. Atreus asks Mr. McCreary on where they can find a dwarf named Durlin and telling the dwarf that Durlin is our friend. This sequence is funny because McCreary tells us that Durlin has like no friends. Is it just me or does every dwarf make fun of each other? So far, they're my favorite race in this mythology. They act more like humans than humans do. Also, I kind of relate to them because I am a 5'4", so there's that. Regardless, the dwarves tell us where Durlin is located and we make our way to him. Along the way, we meet Sindri's bitch ass and he gives us a certain ability that can clear our paths that are blocking the way. Part of my brain is thinking that they're only giving us these abilities only for the means of traversal, which isn't a good sign. Like, sure, you can use these arrows in combat and stun enemies, whatever it might be, but when you're playing on easier difficulties, you don't need them. Kratos already has a stun ability. Even on balanced difficulty, I didn't really even need them. Of course, it can still be effective, but not to the degree I was hoping. I can't really critique this part considering what other things can developers give us. I mean, can you think of any? I'm just going to say it's a tad disappointing and move on.
After doing some side quest bonding with Atreus and Mira, we finally get to Durlin. Before we actually talk to Durlin, though, Atreus mentions that he should be the one doing the talking, considering Kratos is built like a brick shit house. This makes a lot of sense, but I also see there was another reason behind the interaction. It shows the trust that Kratos has with Atreus. In the last game, if you guys don't recall, Kratos was usually the one doing the talking. For one, it was because Kratos didn't trust Atreus fully, but also it was because Atreus was young and not that wise. In this game, they kind of flipped it on its head. Since Atreus knows more about the events of Ragnarok and where to find Tyr, Kratos hands the reins to Atreus since this is his adventure and story to uncover. I like these certain aspects in games where building trust is the primary focus. But anyways, when we talk to Durlin, initially he's not wanting to talk to us, essentially making fun of us saying that carrying around a severed head isn't going to persuade him into telling them all they want to know. Kratos then speaks saying they are looking for a prisoner. When Kratos says this, Durlin has an oh shit look on his face, indicating that he isn't supposed to tell the two where he is. But when Kratos turns around, Durlin sees the axe that Faye, Kratos' wife, used to have. And if you guys don't remember, Faye had some sort of a relationship with the dwarves, along with Durlin, and I believe they were going to fight the gods. Although that rebellion didn't work out, the dwarves love Faye. So Durlin seeing that axe sparked a sort of emotion out of him. Durlin sacks up and asks Kratos if he chopped her head off with that axe. But Kratos stands firm and is menacing, saying that Faye was his wife, which prompts Durlin to back off. Kratos then kind of snaps unexpectedly, telling Durlin that Faye is dead. I love this scene for a couple of reasons. One is because it shows the amount of care that Kratos had for Faye. Beforehand, we never really saw Kratos as the loving type, especially when it involves falling in love with someone. So seeing this now makes me smile a bit. You see the growth he has had over the course of some years. Character development at its finest. Also, I love it because Durlin feels the exact same way as Kratos. Durlin thought she just went AWOL after the rebellion, but upon finding out she died, you could see something broke inside of him. He cared deeply for her, the same way that Brock and Sindri showed back in the last game. Connections like these adding to lore will always make me happy playing a video game. It keeps everything cohesive while at the same time evoking emotion out of the player. After this whole emotional conversation transitions, Durlin then goes on this tangent by explaining that he can't help us while at the same time writing some stuff on a scroll. He says that it is a fine for breaking his desk. What a bitch! The little baby Kraken thing though, named Dinner, <laughs> That's <laughs> funny as shit. Gives Atreus something. Afterwards, when we make our way outside after some combat, Atreus tells us that it isn't a fine. It actually is directions on where to find Tyr. The whole time Durlin was acting so, Odin wouldn't find out about us trying to find Tyr. Smart little dwarf. The acting was so good, honestly, to where it... I thought Durlin wasn't going to help us. These are the surprises that I'm talking about in this game. They're handled so well. Along the way to free Tyr, Mimir gives us some backstory on what exactly happened to Durlin's big ass forehead. Mimir mentions the god Heimdall, the one who holds Galarhorn. He mentions that Heimdall burned the mark into Durlin's head because of the rebellion punishment. That's fucked. Though it does make for a badass scar. I always love these little lore tidbits that Mimir states. It gives the player some basis to go off of to understand Norse mythology without having to look it up in the codex. He also adds some humor to it as well, keeping the player intrigued. The way they handle this is masterclass story writing. Mimir also says something important about Heimdall. He says that he is so loyal to Odin, which is why he has Galarhorn. Keep in mind that there are a few people who are truly loyal to Odin. This makes me think that we will encounter Heimdall in some form. After a couple of boss fights and thousands of enemies later, we get to Tyr. When we see him, Tyr seems delusional, thinking that Odin is playing a trick on him. Kratos cuts him free and questions if this actually is the Norse god of war. Kratos having his blades of chaos unsheathed, Tyr comments on them, telling Kratos that he knows exactly what he did in Olympus, killing the entire Greek pantheon. This gets Tyr scared, asking Kratos if he is the next one to be killed by him. I love how this game is more aware about Kratos' past. A lot of characters in the game will comment on it, not to mention Kratos mentions it a lot more as well. These moments where characters talk about it are pretty badass. Hearing what Kratos did makes my testosterone levels rise and makes me want to break my fucking monitor because of how cool it sounds. Boys, raise your hand if you feel the exact same way. Tyr even goes as far to address Kratos as God Killer. Hell yes. Tyr then gets scared when Kratos tries to help him. He doesn't seem like himself. Mimir then tries to talk to him, but Tyr thinks that Kratos killed Mimir. 
This brings us to a tailing section after Atreus chases after him. Don't worry, this chasing section isn't actually chasing. You aren't on a time crunch. It's just a narrative device that is placed, and I have no problem with it. It only raises the stakes, which is a good thing. We finally get to Tyr, and we can see that Atreus is trying to talk some sense into him, telling Tyr that they're only there to help him. Kratos has enough of it, though. He picks up Tyr by the shoulders and pins him to the wall. He yells at Tyr, explaining that he is a leader of men, essentially, and he needs to act like it. Kratos then explains that his son brought him to this place to save him. Tyr needs to be thankful instead of being a little bitch. Seeing Kratos angry for the sake of caring for Atreus is amazing. Emotional storytelling connecting with badassery is a mixture I never thought I would enjoy. Atreus tells Tyr that he knows what Tyr stood for, that he helped the giants. Atreus wanted to return the favor by breaking him out of the mine. Seeing Atreus still opening up his heart to people even when Kratos told him not to is such a nice touch. I really don't know how to explain what I'm feeling when I realize this, but good God doesn't make me feel some type of way. After he talks him sense into tear, he finally stands up, revealing himself to be a center for the Golden State Warriors being a fucking 9-3 behemoth. Atreus then tries to give a spear to tear, but he declines. At this point, red flags are raised in my head regarding tear. Tyr's the god of war, but he doesn't want to fight and protect himself? Like, I know he's a god who cared most about mortals, but still, it didn't make sense to me until later in the game, and I'll elaborate on this further when the time comes. Later during gameplay, we get a little insight into what Tyr's thinking. Atreus tells him that Ragnarok is coming, and he hopes that Tyr knows that by now. Tyr then asks the question of it, if they freed him only to start a war? Again, this raises some red flags that he wants to delay Ragnarok or not fight in it. Tyr asks what exactly the two want from him. If it is the god of war they want, they won't get it. He wants to avoid war at all costs. This goes hand in hand with the way Kratos is thinking, and I love the connections that this game is making. Everything feeds into Kratos' way of thinking and not Atreus's. This pushes the main idea of this whole game, finding out who exactly Atreus is, about him finding out what his destiny entails. But at the same time, they're raising red flags with Tyr, like I said earlier, about him not wanting to fight. So there's that dichotomy between you agree, but you don't agree, which is oddly good. We finally brought Tyr to Sindri's house. Sindri, of course, is super sarcastic about having more people dirty up his perfect home. After Tyr goes inside, Atreus asks if he can speak with Kratos, but Kratos brushes him off, saying that they will speak in the morning. And you'll find this happening a lot within the game, where Kratos doesn't really want to talk about anything without thinking about it first. A clear character change from what he used to be back in the previous games where he acted before thinking, and I like this attention to detail. After we drop off Tyr at Sindri's house, a cutscene plays, and I'm going to let this cutscene play out because for one, it's very important regarding the trust that Kratos has for Atreus, but also there's a huge game pivot here with characters. What are you thinking, brother? I am thinking. I want things to be the way they were. Well, I'd like to claim a tree again. Certain ships have sailed. I just wish Atreus were not so... restless. I care only for your safety. I know, brother. But holding him too tight won't keep him out of danger. The lad's determined to make a few mistakes of his own. And I hate to say it, but I think Tyr might be one of them. I've never seen a man broken so completely. His pain is fresh. You expect too much. Ah, perhaps. Pretty Freya still wants to kill you. That's an ally we could use. That is not an option. No, I don't suppose it is. Trouble sleeping. Ah! Shh. You cannot sneak up on me like that. There's something I have to do in Midgard. What? Without me? I thought we were partners. We are. Just wasn't sure you'd want to join me. I'm visiting. An old friend. Oh, I see. Or possibly not doing that, taking into account she's determined to murder you. She wouldn't really. Oh, look, I think it's lovely that you see the best in people. I really do. And I want you to continue to see the best in people by not getting yourself murdered. 
But we need her. It's worth the risk. Is it, though? I love this cutscene so much because it shows the vulnerability of Kratos. He cared deeply about Atreus and is worried about him running into danger head on with optimism. Kratos believes that if he keeps doing these actions, it could get him killed. Very much a parental instinct. You agree with Atreus and Kratos on this. On, on one hand, not doing anything will result in Ragnarok still happening with no preparation and the possibility of a lot of people getting hurt. But on the other side, if Kratos lets Atreus do his thing, there is a possibility that Atreus will die or get hurt trying to find the answers he He's looking for, especially since he intends to seek out Freya, who is hell-bent on killing the both of them. Not to mention, let's give a round of applause to Sindri. He's like a cool-ass uncle who doesn't necessarily like what Atreus is doing, but still goes along with him on the journey to make sure he doesn't get hurt. I never would have thought to see the care that Sindri has for everyone in the party. This very much reminds me of the storytelling of Mass Effect, where there are a lot of people in your party that care deeply for you, such as the ensemble cast and a whole bunch of characters in one spot. This type of storytelling works a lot of the time, and especially does in God of War. But regardless, Sindri then tries to keep Atreus safe by telling him instead of seeking answers with Freya, why not do so with the World Serpent first? At least we know the giant ass snake is friendly, but we all know Atreus is still going to talk to Freya, so the point doesn't matter. The most important part here, though, is that you get to play as Atreus, and I never would have thought they would ever do this. I love this so much, you have no idea. It gives off the Last of Us vibes where the game switches up and makes you play as Ellie, but seeing Atreus's point of view is so important to all of this. I want to hear what he's thinking. I want to understand his thought process. I want to understand why he's so hell-bent on finding out how to go forth with Ragnarok or try to avoid it. This transition between characters is just so well done. The saddest part after this cutscene, though, is when Atreus mentions that friend died. Sindri mentions that they have gone on adventures with the wolf before, so after hearing that, it broke me. When animals die, it pains me. Regardless, we push forward to try to find Jormungandr. While we get closer to the giant snake, there are conversations between Atreus and Sindri that are important and shows the care that Sindri has for everyone. Atreus asks Sindri what got him so worked up. Sindri simply responds by saying he needs to look after the people he cares about and keep bad things from happening to them. And I love this. Sindri's worried about everyone since Ragnarok is coming. The man is so innocent, but he still tries to keep helping people regardless. He cares for Atreus, Kratos, Brock, and everyone that he's involved with. That really is the message of the game. You need to care for the people close to you because when they're gone, you won't get that time back with them. And remember that. Soon after Atreus calls for Jormungandr by literally talking to him, <laughs> his eyes glow and all that shit, and it's pretty creepy and cool at the same time. Even Sindri mentions how creepy it is. Regardless, the world serpent awakens and causes everything to come crashing down. Finally, when the snake is ready to talk, Atreus introduces himself and asks it some questions. Keep in mind, we don't really know what Atreus asks him either. The snake speaks. Atreus mentions that the snake said something about a place called Ironwood. The player and Atreus have no idea what or where this place is, but we understand that we will be there at some point or another. I swear to God, when the snake slithers away, he says, you'll be there. I'm gonna let that play to see if you guys hear it as well. When the snake is gone, Sindri's just covered in snake slobber, which is hilarious. Literally everything bad happens to the dude. Now that I think about it, it's sad but still funny at the same time. Atreus still questions Ironwood though. Like I said, this is very important. Sindri afterwards then mentions Freya, asking Atreus if he is going to just walk up to Freya and talk to her while at the same time literally mentions where Freya is. Sindri, you really need to think before you speak. He even says fuck right after knowing that he mentioned where she is. I uh, now. I I feel even more bad for Sindri. After some traveling and battling enemies, Sindri finds an old shop and stays behind to fix it up, leaving only us to go and find Freya. Though I do wish Sindri would come with us, it does make sense to leave him behind. After all, he literally is the person that crafted the mistletoe arrows. When we get to Freya, Atreus yells for her name. When he does this, she ropes him up with some plants. Poison, ivy, looking ass. <laughs> anyway, she asks us where Kratos is, but Atreus says that he is in Midgard and that he doesn't know that Atreus is in Midgard. After telling Freya this, she threatens to kill Atreus. She then puts her sword to his throat and finds the necklace with the mistletoe arrow. Bro, you fucked. Up. <laughs> but surprisingly, she seems surprised and doesn't want to kill him. Maybe this is because he's just a kid. Maybe she has compassion for him after all. I'm not necessarily sure, but I will say it would be out of character for her to hurt Atreus even after the death of Balder, though she still seems adamant about 
killing Kratos. That part makes sense. Atreus fires back by saying he isn't the one to blame for everything, and she knows it. I love this little dialogue here, planting the seeds of doubt in Freya's mind. She, of course, knows that Odin is the one to blame for everything she's endured. Odin is the real enemy, not Kratos. Atreus saying this may have sparked something in her to think critically about her revenge quest against Kratos. Freya mentions that she has no way to get to Odin, but it doesn't matter because Ragnarok will eventually get to him. Atreus reveals something important though, something that I really think he shouldn't have said, but he did anyway. He reveals that Odin came to Midgard along with Thor, that he offered peace if we didn't get involved, that Odin has found a way to avert his death. Atreus also mentions what he had seen within the giant murals about Groa's prophecy about the giants. Since Freya doesn't know about the death of the giants, she mentions that they'll wait for Ward and Jotunheim. But of course, from the last game, we know that all of the Jotnar are dead. The big but, though, is that Atreus is part giant, so maybe he is the one that will lead them to war? Regardless, Atreus mentions this to Freya, and she seems surprised to hear this. This causes her to let go of Atreus from the vines. Now, on my first playthrough, this puzzled me. Why would she just let him go like that after mentioning this? But on my second playthrough, I realized why. She let him go because, since Atreus literally is giant, he is the one that will lead them to war. He is the person the prophecy was talking about. So when Freya hears this, she knows that she can't kill him because if she does, Odin has a possibility of not dying. I love these thoughts that aren't mentioned. It engages a thought process with the player. I will say I may be wrong about my assumption. If that is the case, let me know in the comments. Atreus mentions that since Freya can fight again, they should team up and stop Odin, but Freya is a broken character. The death of her son, binded to the realm by Odin, she says that she is far from whole and won't be able to fight alongside them, especially since Kratos is the one who killed her son. She wants revenge for that, but Atreus mentions something big that they have found Tyr, that he is still alive. This surprises Freya. Atreus also mentions that they have found a way to travel to most of their realms, though I don't think it was a good idea to mention this to Freya. It was important to tell her though, because if we have found a way, there is a possibility that Freya can find a way. Then she may be able to help us if she can get past the revenge quest. Speaking on the Atreus shouldn't have mentioned this part, if you look in the codex after the conversation, Atreus mentions the same thing, that he probably shouldn't have mentioned any of this to Freya, and I find this a little touch good. I usually am not a fan of reading codex pages in games, but in this game, they do it well. All of a sudden, though, Freya casts us away and says, enough, telling us to never come back, to go before she changes her mind. Also saying that his father is still going to die for what he had done. It is so sad to see Freya in this broken state, but I understand it. Losing a child is one of the most heartbreaking things ever. This is a theme that is touched on over and over again in this game. I will mention them when they come up. On our way back to Sinji's house, there's an important conversation that takes place. Sinji mentions that there was an accident at the forest that involved Brock. Brock actually died. Sinji decided that he couldn't handle being alone, so he went to the Lake of Souls in Alfheim and stole him back. As I said, there is a theme of loss happening in this game that you need to pay attention to. Hearing this, though, is sad. Even after the shit the two brothers went through in the previous game, not talking to each other for a long while, Sinji still cares deeply about him. He couldn't bear to be alone without his brother. The character development in these short little dialogue sequences are amazing. It seems like they took a page out of The Last of Us book and it worked wonders. Of course they did the same in the previous game, but not to the degree they are doing it now. Sindri mentions that he could only get back three of his four soul parts, meaning a part of them is missing. He wants to tell Brock, but what would happen if he does? He tries to get advice from Atreus on what he should do, and of course Atreus mentions that he should tell him, but Sindri kind of uses this against him telling Atreus that he should be honest with his father as well. But Atreus brushes this off by saying that it isn't the same thing. And I love these little jabs at Atreus. He is being hypocritical. Atreus deserves to be told that what he's doing is wrong, and if he keeps going down this path, he's going to put his loved ones in danger. When we get back to the house, Atreus tries to act normally. When Kratos asks where he's been, Atreus literally answers by saying he was taking a piss. This came out of left field and I laughed. This is such a teen thing to say, I just couldn't help but chuckle. As I've said before, these little comedic moments are so welcome in the story, it breaks up tension incredibly well and lets the player breathe for a small period of time. Afterwards, everyone gets some grub. 
Kratos then proposes his plan to Atreus, saying that their next stop is Alfheim. They are going there to seek some information, and I love this little scene. It shows that Kratos is willing to walk the path that Atreus is on. He wants to find out answers as well. This character growth between the two is so awesome, I can't gush about it enough. Tyr mentioned that there's a shrine to Groa there, that Atreus has found it before. During this breakfast time thing that they're having, the chemistry between Brock and Sindri is just so fucking funny. After Brock gives Kratos a seed to travel to Alfheim, he smacks his hand on the table, sending a piece of food flying into Sindri's bowl, which causes Sindri to like throw a fit. The two must be my favorite characters in the game by far. This game is funnier than I would have thought. Throughout this game, I was seriously genuinely laughing. Not a lot of games can do that, and I applaud the writers. When I was getting my degree in script writing, one of the hardest genres to pull off is comedy. Nowadays, it's just really hard to get a laugh out of an audience. So seeing them succeed like this is amazing. When we make our way to the portal, we get greeted by a friendly squirrel named Prozidis. Sorry, I mean Ratatasker. He is the squirrel that tends to the world tree. He snags the seed that dinner, the Kraken hatchling gave us when we were in Svartalfheim. Ratatasker mentions that the squirrels that we have seen previously are only spectral versions of him with different personalities. I don't remember these in the previous game, so if he was there, let me know in the comments. The funniest part about this encounter though is when one of his personalities named Bitter yells out to Ratatasker, fuck off, I'm busy. That shit had me rolling. Regardless, he puts the seed into his mouth and spits it out for us. This seed helps us travel to Alfheim in order to see the mural. We then go on our way with Tyr behind us. As we're in Alfheim, the war is still going on between the realms. Since the last time we were here, it seems like the light elves are winning. There are a lot of conversations in this section talking about the war between the two factions. The important conversations talk about which of the war is right with Atreus asking. Tyr sends a good message to Atreus and Kratos follows. Tyr says that if you don't know what side is worth fighting for, it is probably best to not fight at all. This brings a fair point. This also connects with Atreus' viewpoint on the eventual war on Asgard. Which side is right? As Seer says, it is rarely so simple. We eventually reach the top of the light of Alfheim. When this happens, Kratos looks back to see the light and walks towards it. Something is drawing him to it. We found out that Faye is calling to him again since she technically is in the light of Alfheim now. I'm not really sure why it's drawing him to it though. Is there some sort of power? What happens when he gets stuck in there? I mean, we already know that, but what happens if it happens again? I'm not sure if these questions are ever answered. If they are, let me know. But Atreus eventually stops us and tells Kratos that Faye is gone, that he needs to let go. This constant reminder of loss in this game makes me think there's more to come. But regardless, the trio pushes forward. I'm going to let the cutscene of Groa's prophecy play out because it is incredibly hard to summarize and have it all make sense. This is very important because, like I said before, these shrines literally tell you the plot of the game. It just doesn't tell you the little details. Ah, yes. Here we have Drua's search for her missing husband. She was relentless in her attempt to find him. Meditated for weeks on end. Unfortunately, she found... something else. A vision of Ragnarok. Word of Groa's vision reached Odin. He sought her out. Demanded a private retelling. Didn't like what he had, apparently. Ironwood? That's the... I don't know what that is. The mythical sanctuary for giants. Curious. So it's in Jotunheim? I know some giants thought so, but Ironwood isn't anywhere, lad. It's a concept, a metaphorical paradise. It's not real. Presumably, Groa requested her ashes be returned to Jotunheim, while her soul found peace in the light. Difficult to imagine Odin respecting those wishes. Hmm. The champion? I think it's supposed to be... me. You assume too much. Aye. Best not to read into these abstractions so literally. Prophecies are slippery by nature. Although, some are more obvious than others. Ragnarok. Aye. The end of everything. So this is it. There's nothing we can do to stop it. There must be a way. Why else is this hidden? Look, here. This is what we saw. It's you, fighting in Ragnarok. No, I don't. I can't. What's this then? That's new. Asgard is destroyed? The other realms thrive? And Odin dies. Shit. 
she lied. Roa lied? Of course she did. <laughs> Odin's working off a false prophecy. <laughs> so then, we can win Ragnarok. We can beat Odin. We are not present in any of this. But that was Tyr leading the charge against Asgard. Plus, Hell's army was there. And the elves. Champion. Okay. Whoever that is, doesn't matter. But for the first time, we know something Odin doesn't. We just saw we can win. Tyr? I won't allow prophecy to define my choices. But, but we just saw No, you. Atreus. This is wrong. Come. There is much to discuss. It is time. So we see that Odin is working off a of false prophecy. What had me curious though is Tyr's confusion. Why is he so focused on the mural right after Kratos says Odin dies? At this point, I was starting to have doubts about everything. The more important thing though is Atreus' thoughts. He wants war so badly, but why? Because of prophecy? In order to stop Ragnarok? I understand that after he found out Loki's supposed to be the catalyst for Ragnarok, he becomes fixated on it, but the game never explains plain on why that is so. I guess he's falling into some tendencies the same as last game where after he found out he was a god he got all cocky in this case after he thinks he is the champion the same thing happens the reason i have a problem with this is because of the repetition you don't want the same plot point to be present again you want to be different granted this plot point isn't very big after playing the game twice, but I think my point still stands. I understand that Atreus as a teenager is going headfirst into everything, but repetition in games is something you really should avoid. Atreus even later, after the cutscene, says that we can win Ragnarok. Tyr then objects by saying there will be other casualties. Like I mentioned, I understand Atreus' motives, but I don't understand at the same time. Later, after battling some elves, Tyr ends up killing an elf and is sad about it. Now this brings up some more red flags. Not in the means of storytelling, but in the means of Tyr's intentions. He tells Atreus and Kratos that the elf was innocent even when they were actively attacking the three. This was a big WTF moment. Considering Kratos and Atreus were simply defending themselves, he claims that doing this will bring war to Asgard and that Kratos and Atreus will only bring destruction with them. Although this is true, Tyr of all people should know that Odin and the rest of Asgard needs to be destroyed in order for the other realms to prosper. Not to mention, it is Fimblewinter and Baldur has died. Right? Ragnarok is unavoidable at this point, so why would you be bitching? We will find out later, but shortly after the elves seem to be alive and cuts his arm off in order to be free, and for some reason Atreus traces after it. I have no idea why he would do this, considering he's been killing elves left and right with Kratos, and I'm pretty sure this was only for dramatic purposes, which is a a negative in my book. It just makes no sense why he would chase after the soon-to-be-dead elf. Whatever, I guess. Atreus then approaches Tyr and apologizes, but Tyr really has none of it and brushes Atreus off. He says that he should never have come with them. I don't know, man. Tyr's just being really weird. He and Kratos were the people that came up with the plan in the first place, so just because he finds out that Ragnarok is unavoidable, he gets mad and Atre at Atreus and Kratos? What? I'm just not really vibing with this dude. Like, I understand the death of the elf had something to do with it, but my point still stands. He got mad at us for killing an elf himself. He's a hypocrite. On our way back to Sindri's house, Kratos mentions that he opposes prophecy and war, which is understandable after what he did to Olympus. Mimir mentions that the old tier seems to not be there anymore, which is concerning. And I totally agree with Mimir. Atreus then brings up a good point by mentioning the giants foretold the entire journey of the first game. His point of view is that if they got it right on that journey, who is to say they won't get it right this time around? This whole section has some good and bad. I don't like Atreus' outlook on things because they make sense in some parts, but others they don't. It's like a mix of good and bad story writing. For example, the good was the questioning of prophecy and if it really is true. I also like the mixed feelings about Tyr. The bad, however, is Atreus' writing at some parts, like chasing the elf. What the fuck was that for? There was no point to it. Another example is when Tyr got mad at us for killing an elf himself. It just doesn't make sense to why that was even a plot point. 
to maybe incite doubt to the player, they could have done this in other ways. Eventually, we all had dinner again. Tyr gives Atreus something to eat and says, a male fit for a champion. Okay, what the fuck? Didn't Tyr just get mad at Atreus for trying to go to war with Asgard? <laughs> so why is he telling Atreus that he's a champion? as in champion in the mural. Yeah, whoever wrote this is not doing a good job at this point. There are so many contradictions, it is driving me crazy. Maybe there's a reason for this? There probably is, to be honest, because Tears has been weird as fuck. Kratos then tells Tyr to not say that to Atreus, that it only clouds his judgment. Atreus gets agitated though, saying that it is only a word. Then Atreus says his go-to, saying that the giants are counting on him, but Kratos interrupts by saying, what giants? I must sow with Kratos on this. Atreus is for sure making plenty of mistakes and foolish risks. It is almost like he's actively trying to seek out war, and this little dude has never been in one. His whole reasoning is because of the giants, which although makes sense because of the previous game outcome, the reasoning doesn't mean that you should just run headfirst in the danger without proper thinking. The thing that sets Kratos over the edge though is when Atreus comes himself Loki. This causes Kratos to explode and yell at him. He states that he isn't Loki, he is Atreus, his son. Of course, like any teen would do if they got yelled at by their dad, he says he isn't hungry and walks away. When Atreus gets to his room, Sindri calms him down by saying a good night's rest will help him be better in the morning. Sindri's just such a good guy, we don't deserve him. But regardless, Atreus eventually goes to sleep. When Atreus goes to sleep with his little marble looking thing, he eventually wakes up in a place similar to the doorways that open from the murals. When he is in this place, he starts to see visions of himself in the past, mostly nightmare stuff, including him killing Modi and disregarding Kratos. I'm not necessarily sure why this stuff is here. It is never elaborated on further in the game, but regardless, he wakes up in a beautiful place. It rivals Svartifime on the prettiest scale. Atreus follows a pack of wolves until eventually he runs into a young woman, Anger Boda. I'm going to let the scene play out. I'm not finished with it yet. <gasps> the pain is made from the bark of the ironwood trees. They absorb the memories of the forest so that the paint remembers too. Memories of the past. Of the future. I'd hate to get blood on it. Oh, well, it's really you. Uh, you know who I am? What's wrong? I've been waiting my whole life for this moment. Huh. You look weirder than I imagined. Oh. Sorry. <sighs> um, was that mean? Kind of. Damn it. I'm already messing this up. <laughs> it's just you're the first person that I've talked to in a very long time. And weird can be good. Uh, thanks. Let's start over. I'm Angravoda. You must have a lot of questions. Uh, yeah, where Follow are me. we? You'll get your answer soon enough. As we could see, Atreus has caught the love bug. In Norse lore, Angerboda is actually Loki's wife, and their children involved Jormungandr and Fenrir. In all actuality, this game honors that lore in which you will see soon. I like this scene for plenty of different reasons. For one, the chemistry between the two is just amazing. The way they pull off the awkward teenager love thing is great acting. Not to mention the beginning of the scene gives you a small hint at where you are. Who are the people in this game that predict the future? 
the Giants. This indicates that most likely Anger Boda is a giant. Also, they talked about a place called Ironwood, a paradise of sorts for giants in which people thought was made up. I really can't gush enough about the environments in this game. They really went all out and I commend the developers so much. This rivals The Last of Us remake in terms of beauty. Regardless, Anger Boda says that we will get our answers soon enough and mentions that she has been waiting for us. She only knows us as Loki. As I have said previously, everyone thought that Ironwood wasn't a real place. Anger Boda tells us that it was Made that way so Odin won't go searching at the forest for giants in a place that he thinks doesn't exist. It is very clever using the strategy but still a little risky. Atreus asks an important question along the way that even I wanted to know or what most people want to know. Why was Anger Boda waiting for Atreus? She gives her the reason that it is her destiny to tell Atreus his, playing into the plot points of fate throughout this game. I love this for the simple fact that all around Atreus, you have these characters talking about destiny and fate. You have the Kratos side where he keeps telling him that fate or destiny isn't real. You, the person, write your own fate. It isn't written out for you. On the other hand, you have the giants such as Faye and Anger Boda, where they literally prove that destiny is written out. Anger Boda knew about Loki before even Atreus did. She knew that he would end up there. So this duality between parties actively separates Atreus from his father and those around Kratos. Also at the same time, as we will see in a bit, maybe the written out fate you are given isn't the one you want, so therefore you want to change said fate. This conversation that the game has with the player brings tons of questions, which is a good thing. It helps keep the player intrigued and involved with the overall narrative. We eventually got to Anger Boda's sanctuary where there's paintings all around. She's an artist if you can't tell. We eventually get to see the mural that lays out the path for Atreus and Kratos. Of course, he sees the things he's already done, such as scattering Faye's ashes on the Talos Peak in all of the realms, but as you remember, he hasn't seen Kratos' fate yet. Only Kratos has done so. And during the scene, Atreus finally sees it, Kratos dying at the hands of what seems to be Thor, and gets raised by Odin. After seeing this, Atreus gets angry. I mean, I would too if Odin's bitch ass became my replacement, dad. We then see Atreus actively turn into a wolf, just like he did at the beginning when he turns into a bear. It is like his own Spartan rage, so to speak. It is sparked by anger. I find this connection pretty cool. They use Kratos' rage and Loki's known shape-shifting power and mash the two together to keep continuity intact. Anger Boda eventually calms him down and he shifts back into his normal self. The weird thing is, after she calms him down, they get into some sort of argument. I guess I wouldn't call it an argument, but Anger Boda gets mad at him for some reason. I could get that she had to prepare for him to come to Ironwood at some time or another, but still comes out of left field. I don't know if this was some sort of acting direction mix up or if it was actually intended with her character, but overall, it wasn't a poor choice, but I think they could have handled this a tiny bit better. Regardless, she does apologize. She tells a Atreus that he shouldn't focus on the mural as of right now and offers to go on a walk to take his mind off things and of course he accepts. During this time not a lot of stuff happens. In all honesty this is one of the more drawn out parts, arguably too long. You just get close to Anger Boda and get to know what makes her tick. And to summarize everything in a couple of sentences, she's very much an animal lover, she loves to draw, her parents aren't around anymore, and her sole purpose in the world through her eyes is to deliver Loki his destiny. Now I know that summarization doesn't do her much justice, but you really need to play this game in order to love this character. If I literally went line by line analyzing everything, this video would be 10 hours long. The most interesting part that I will analyze though is the relationship between her and Atreus. It's odd to comment on this since they're like young teenagers, but you can clearly tell that there is some infatuation with one another. Both of their personalities are very similar in many aspects. They are both super caring and have the same sort of harsh upbringing, so to speak. A lot of their conversations go into depth about destiny, about what exactly it means to walk your own path. I find all this interesting to listen to because within myself, I believe that destiny isn't written out for you. You write it yourself with the actions and decisions you make. Hearing the conversations between the two engaged my thinking even made me question what destiny actually is. If a game makes you do this, it is a huge plus in my book. Some of the greatest things in media usually have you thinking in depth about what exactly the viewpoint of the narrative is, if you agree with it or not. That questioning only keeps you engaged, but in certain cases can be life-changing. For example, The Last of Us has you questioning what exactly love entails. Is love worth risking everything for? That answer really is up to you to decide. In this game, it is very much the idea of can fate be broken? Let me know down in the comments what you think. So during this long ordeal in Ironwood, you help out Anger Boda with the various chores in order to get your mind off the mural. This includes getting certain fruit for animals, collecting roots, and so forth. The important parts happen toward the end. First, Anger Boda tells us that there's a soul in our knife. Interesting. Wonder who that could be. 
B. Then after going through the world a bit, Anger Botus says that she has a surprise for us. She leads us to a hilltop with a cool ass rock. Then she says something important to Atreus. Oh, more marbles. Wait, you've seen these before? Not these, but I found a few in Midgar. Where? Inside your mother's murals. <laughs> oh, but that's... There are more out there. What are they? Just look. Yahtzee. Brother? Hey, careful. Borrow. Giants. These belong to the giants? These are the giants. They had a choice. They could stay in Jotunheim, waiting for Odin to find a way in to slaughter them. Or they could hide. My father helped whisper their souls into these. And before he died, he passed them on to me. It's within these. They're your responsibility. Are you sure? Well, that's what my mother saw. You're supposed to know what to do with them when the time comes. And when's that? I don't know. Head back. This is a lot of responsibility. It is. It's all yours. Hey, you okay? Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm just, I'm done. I guess. Now that I've given you those, my part in all this is over. Y you could always come with me. We could fight Odin together. I was supposed to fight alongside you? I wouldn't disappear from your damn mural halfway through. I understand. Well... We shouldn't break up the set. Don't you think? So as we see, the giant souls are put in these marbles. You can see the anger Boda is extremely protective of this. What I don't understand though is her sudden outbursts. Like Atreus is only trying to understand everything. You don't need to blow up on him a couple of times before he understands. It's like anger Boda is trying to be Kratos. Although the dialogue was kind of weird at some points, the scene still hits its point. It is now Atreus's job to know what to do with the giants. The thing to focus most on though is the calm nature that Atreus has with anger Boda you can tell even when he met her a little bit ago, he cares deeply for her. When she has her sudden outburst, he does what he can to calm her down within seconds. I don't know how else to explain what I'm feeling besides smiling, if that makes sense. Seeing a young Atreus fall in love just makes my heart warm. Also, another important detail to talk about is Atreus' sudden reversal on destiny. Atreus tells Angerboda that she can come with him and fight Odin. Later on, he says again that just because some dumb mural says that her story is over, it doesn't really have to be over. This reversal with Atreus really sparks character growth going forward in the game, and I love it. You'll see soon enough.
After doing some favors to Anger Boda, Atreus and her take a stop to see the fireflies come out. Atreus loves the beauty of this. Keep in mind, you can stay here as long as you want, I believe. I like these moments because it gives you time to ponder on the choices Atreus has made. It lets you think about the relationship that is blossoming between Anger Boda and Atreus. Soon after, Atreus and Anger Boda witness a kidnapping of a wolf. Anger Boda mentions that it was her grandmother, Gryla. Gryla steals these animals and takes their soul away from them. She does this in order to feel what they feel. I guess it's like some sort of drug that she's addicted to, like crack. With that being understood, the duo go after Gryla to free the wolf. At this point, I was starting to see how drawn out this section was, but I understand that it is still needed. You need to know just a tad bit more about Gryla. I would have broken this section up a bit though, go after Gryla a little later in the story in order to give better pacing, but regardless, the two push forward for Gryla's place. Once we get there, we come across a soulless snake. Atreus comes up with the idea of putting a giant soul into the snake. Now, you see where this is going, don't you? Baby Jormungandr's born. This is why the World Serpent mentioned a place called Ironwood during the beginning of the game, because that is where he first met Atreus. I like this loop that they did. It makes it lore accurate where Yormi is Atreus's child. I mean, he literally made Yormi in this game. I don't know, I just find this scene super cool. Afterwards, the snake just slithers away without saying a word. I find this odd, but I guess it is what it is. We keep pushing forward to where the captured wolf might be. As soon as we get into the room, a big ass giant comes walking in, Gryla. A plan is hatched where the anger Boda distracts her grandmother while we try to free the wolf. Solid plan. And once we free the wolf, Gryla sees us and a boss fight ensues. And of course we whoop her ass. When we break the cauldron, the cauldron that steals the souls from the animals, Gryla gets pissed and yells at anger Boda saying that she wished she was never born. And that Loki will only be a small piece of her story that he won't remember her. And at this point, I feel sorry for Anger Boda. The type of storytelling makes you want to come back to Anger Boda at some point, which is a good thing. You now have a connection with another character. I know I said before that the section kind of drags, but after my second time playing, it's not really bad. Afterwards, Anger Boda gives us some backstory with her grandmother. She tells us that even though her grandmother seems like an awful person, well, she is, Gryla cares for Anger Boda in her own way. She uses the example of times where Gryla said she didn't care about Anger Boda, but that following night, she would make her bread. So deep down, Anger Boda knows Gryla cares about her, even though her words say otherwise. This is a direct comparison to Atreus and Kratos if you haven't noticed. Kratos has a hard authoritarian personality, but he cares for Atreus in his own way. He trains Atreus so he will be okay when Kratos ultimately leaves according to the prophecy. He is hard on Atreus for the sole purpose of being able to take care of himself. The story loops surrounding Atreus with these broken relationships remind the player and Atreus that keeping that relationship is more important than what it seems. Afterwards, Atreus tells Anger Boda if she wants to go for a walk, they can do so. When they make it back to the sanctuary, Atreus and Anger Boda talk. Anger Boda makes it point that the reason Atreus can't accept fate is because he cares for his father so much where he can't conceive the thought of losing his father. I just love this statement. It's the truth. There really hasn't been a moment up until now that this statement was made, and I believe it was needed. It brought a tear to my eye. Regardless, Anger Boda gives us a giant marble and tells us to close our eyes and think of home. When Atreus does so, he gets transported to his home in Midgard, which freaks him out. After clearing out some enemies, he makes his way to the portal, but literally runs into Kratos. Kratos says that Atreus has been gone for two days. That long? I guess time runs different in Jotunheim. I think this was mentioned briefly before, but I can't remember. Kratos is understandably frustrated with Atreus. He thinks that Atreus has been lying to him, which he kind of has in all honesty. Kratos pushes Atreus into telling him where he's been, what it is that he won't tell Kratos. But Anger Boda said he can't tell anybody, even his father, what Ironwood is or where it is. Therefore, he must lie. Atreus is stuck in a situation where he wants to tell his father to where the trust is gained again, but also he can't tell him, which causes frustration and tension between the two. This is when the story starts to heat up. Having the tension throughout the game really tugs on your heartstrings because you understand both sides. This is exactly what makes certain conflicts interesting. You have these two ideologies clashing, but you can't pick a side on which you agree. Atreus also brings up the fact that Kratos has secrets, but Atreus still trusts him. This brings hypocrisy into the mix in regards to Kratos. I found this tactic interesting and successful in me siding with Atreus during this argument. Soon after though, we are interrupted by enemies and a boss fight. After we open up a can of serious whoop ass on everyone, the boss fight ended up being Freya. <laughs> Every violation imaginable. No! Oh! 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 
Crash! You do not want this! Hold your mind! Control it! She was our friend! Atreus. Atreus. Behold. Maybe, for the moment, you're of more use to me. A pleasure to see you again. Bronifer. Do not let him out of your sight. You heard him, sunshine. Come on, get a move on. What is it you want? I refuse to remain bound to this realm. We travel to Vanaheim. Well, guess it's just us then. I love this scene so much because of the reversal with Freya. A lot of games would probably have said character turn good again right then and there. But I like in this game how Freya still hates you. It's just you have more use to her alive than dead. So I guess the reversal hasn't happened yet, but the reversal happens over time as you will see. This is what makes this special. It is a growing relationship during gameplay. Having that slow burn with this time of conflict helps out the storytelling tremendously. I can't think of a better way to handle this. Great job, Sony Santa Monica. Anyways, off to Vanaheim with Brock and Freya. When we get to the realm and throughout the level, there's a constant back and forth between Kratos and Freya. Kratos constantly tries to empathize with Freya, trying to get her to see his point of view and also to show her that he is sorry in his own way. On the other hand, Freya is very stubborn. She genuinely believes that most of her problems stem from Kratos. She even says Mimir has some of the blame as well, which I don't see, to be honest, unless I'm missing something. I also find it kind of funny how Brock is just there to witness it all, like it's mommy and daddy fighting. There are very important moments though within these conversations that talk about Kratos' past, trying to empathize with her as I have said. I will talk about these briefly when they come up. Also, throughout this level, Brock mentions Freya's brother, Freyr, a lot, which gives a hint on we are most likely going to see him soon. And within those conversations about Freya's brother, you can clearly tell that it is a broken relationship, the same theme we have seen throughout this game. With this theme present all the time, it is really up to Kratos and Atreus to be the catalyst of mending the relationships back together. It is funny because Kratos and Atreus have some sort of broken relationship when it comes to trust. So seeing these people deal with their own issues, it forces the characters to witness these actions and try to be better within their own relationship. It's a brilliant way of writing characters. They did the same in the previous game, but this time it's just much more elevated. We then finally get to the cutscene where Brock just gets dragged by a rope and you see him hanging upside down. And I, I love dwarves. They just get fucked up every time. It's hilarious. I can't tell you how much I love Brock. Coming out of the shadows though is a stranger threatening Kratos. Bad move. He insinuates that we are working with Odin, but Kratos of course tells him that this isn't the case. But all of the sudden, a whole bunch of people started to surround us. At this point, I started to realize that this character is most likely Freyr, the brother of Freya that I was mentioning. I will say this game does great with surprises, but at the same time, instances like these are just bad surprises. You saw
saw it coming from a mile away. Considering Brock literally said that Freyr was in Vanaheim, it isn't really a drawback per se, but they shouldn't have framed it as a surprise moment. After a standstill between everyone, Kratos shows Mimir to Freyr. It seems like both have bad blood. There really isn't any backstory on this though that is said within the cutscene, but soon after Freya in her bird form shows up to have our back. She tells her brother that we are working with her and everyone gets squared away. Brock stays behind and catch with an old dwarf friend. The funniest part about this is when you go to upgrade your weapons and armor, she will call you a tall glass of milk flirting with us. This kind of charm within the game is what makes it amazing. If you just had the story told without any of this extra dialogue, yeah, sure the game will still be good, but those dialogue sequences are what makes a good game a masterpiece. Throughout the journey with Freya, a whole bunch of conversations take place as I've said before. There are a couple that involve playing on sympathies regarding Freya. Freya takes notice of this and says that the only reason Kratos is doing this is so that he can live and no more fighting is had. One of the more important ones though is when Kratos tells Freya of his past. Freya makes a statement that he has no idea what it feels like to lose a child, but Kratos fires back by saying he does. Freya is of course surprised by this. Kratos says that he used to have a daughter, that in his promise to a god, that said god led him to a village where his family resided. Blindly, Kratos slaughtered his family. It was a heart-to-heart -heart moment, and I am glad they acknowledged Kratos' past. They tiptoe around it just enough to where they don't go into full-blown detail and nostalgia of the last games, but they say enough to where it makes sense given the circumstances of the conversation. It was a beautiful execution, and it was nice to hear Kratos recount his memories. It's the growth of his character to be more open with his past. It's amazing. We eventually make it to a boss fight, Nihog. I think I pronounced that right. <laughs> a giant fucking dragon looking thing. I swear the bosses in this game are just so well designed. I don't know any other way to explain it. And after we kick its ass, a cutscene plays. Now, this is important, so I'm going to let it play. Ow! Get out of me! It's over. It's, it's really over. And now that you have what you seek, I suppose. This is the point where I forgive you, where I kill you. Have you decided? I don't think I can do either. There's still a part of me that is so angry that it'll always be, it'll always be angry. But no. You are not the one who needs to die. I do see that. Look. 
everything that's happened between us. No need to explain. Not to me. Not for that. I do not regret saving your life. And never will. But the choice between life and death should have been yours to make. I should not have robbed you of that choice. This is the reversal I was talking about with Freya. She understands now that Kratos isn't the one to blame. It is all on Odin now. Kratos' line, though, that kind of sealed this reversal as a good one was when he said that he doesn't regret saving her life, but he shouldn't have taken away her choice between life and death. Freya understanding that was powerful. It makes sense. Now that she is free from Odin's clutches, because of that, it sealed the realization within Freya's mind. Afterwards, Freya states that now it is time to face her brother and that she needs time to think about how this is the first time that she had a choice. This is fair, and I'm glad they put this little dialogue here. Many times characters dive right into action after a personal realization within themselves. Having a character take time to herself to understand the choice she has made and the choices she will eventually make is amazing. It was a breath of fresh air. Because of said actions with Freya, you can expect to see a domino effect, whether that includes relationships with other characters, relationship with oneself, and other things. Later, we get an introduction to the wolves that chase the moon and sun, Skull and Hati, the same wolves that were in the mural that Atreus discovered. Seeing this confirms that the prophecy that has been foretold is coming into fruition. This detail is important because of Atreus being adamant that it is becoming real. This proves that point to a certain degree. In other details, this transition is so fucking beautiful, what the hell? We get to the camp where Freya formally greets her brother after a long period of time. Freya goes on this speech about how Freya will retake the throne and take back Vanaheim. But Freya declines, stating that this is the first time where she is genuinely free. She has other stuff to do. This conversation takes a turn, though. Freya claims that Vanaheim turned on her. She then blames Freya for not taking anything seriously, considering he is literally drinking. Freya starts talking about how Odin is the one that literally ruined everything. This is honestly hard to argue with since literally everything Odin does fucks up everything around him. It makes sense. Freya wanted him to come and find her after everything, but Freya gets emotional. He states that he was mourning her. He thought she had died. He was in the process of trying to get over the fact that his final words to her weren't nice. Now this is important. Why? Because of the relationship between Kratos and Atreus. Kratos and Atreus have a history on leaving each other on bad terms throughout this game. Seeing these two understand their mistakes and makeup is very important. It is almost a lesson to Kratos and the player. Kratos needs to trust Atreus. If things go south and Atreus leaves because of Kratos' actions, the very thing he is trying to avoid will happen. Every cutscene is a lesson to the protagonist. It is almost like every important moment was crafted with such care and thought. It's amazing storytelling. As soon as we go into the portal, Mimir asks how we're going to approach Atreus about where he's been, and of course, Kratos is going to be blunt with it. Freya comes up with an interesting theory, though. She mentions that if Atreus was alone with Odin, and Odin invited him to Asgard, is it far-fetched to believe that he may have been in Asgard? Players know he wasn't, but having that seed planted into Kratos' mind isn't a good thing when it comes to talking talking to Atreus. We know Kratos may take it too far. So you're back. Are you ready to answer me? About what? Where did you go? Who did you see? Was it Odin? What? Is that what you think? Do you deny it? <laughs> answer me! Did you go to Asgard? No! Of course not! But so what if I did? It's my future, it's my life. You are my son. Then why don't you trust me? If you want me to trust you, then tell me the truth. The truth is you're being a complete asshole. Laddie, you know that's no way to change a man's mind. He doesn't have any faith in me. It's fine if he keeps secrets. It's fine if mom did. That is not fine. Her secrets are hard to be stuck with this path. Oh, okay. So you don't believe in her anymore either? This is not about your mother. What you have done is lie. Wonder where I learned that. That's quite enough. Since when do you always take his side? Since he became the one making sense. Look, I was only thinking about going to Odin. 
But I swear it's for a good reason. There is no good reason to go to Odin. He'll only cloud your mind. But I'd be going for us. I, I gotta stop something bad from happening. Something bad did happen. Look at me, at Freya, at Tia. Odin did this to us. What's well, got everyone caterwauling all of a sudden? Atreus wants to go to Asgard. Asgard? Get kicked in the head or something? Great. I guess everybody's against me now. You must choose who you're going to be. Are you going to continue to lie and keep things from me? Or are you my son? Choose? I never get to choose. Just leave me alone. Listen. Let go of me. Listen. Listen. Let go. What the fuck? Atreus. It's Sindri. Just, just try to keep control. As we see, the very thing that Kratos wanted to avoid happened. I do think that Kratos went about this the wrong way, but this is a good thing regarding the game. It is setting up a reversal later, not only for Kratos' character arc, but also Atreus. Good points were made through this scene on both sides. On Kratos' side, you could see it from a parent's point of view. Atreus is blatantly lying to his father. He is putting himself in danger constantly and putting his entire faith into a prophecy that may or may not become true. This brings up a good question though from the scene before this when Freya and Freya were talking. Do you want the last conversation with a loved one to be an argument? Having these two scenes back to back was such a good decision. The player knows in order to have this relationship be amended, the two of them them and need to come clean with each other. They need to come together and accept their faults and move on. Because if they don't, then maybe the prophecy will come true in a way they never would think would happen. Atreus then finds himself looking for shelter and comes across a giant turtle homie named Charlie, the one from the last game. And his name is Charlie, I'm being dead serious. Charlie is obviously cold, so Atreus forces him to get up in order to get inside. Him? Uh pause. Real pause. What the fuck? Atreus starts a fire in order to get Charlie warm, but shortly after doing so, he hears a peck at the door. Odin's ravens. Atreus lets the ravens in and says that he is ready to see Odin. The ravens surround Atreus and teleport him to Asgard. Now I have a little gripe about the writing during this. Why is Atreus so quick to say, fuck it, let's go to Asgard? Like, I understand that Atreus believes that he can use Odin to his advantage, but it's like he makes up his mind so quick, even though the people he cares about has either been fucking tortured by Odin or been fucked over. The quick judgment of Atreus just feels out of place. If we heard what Odin said to Atreus when Kratos was fighting Thor, then maybe I would have bought into this fact. Like, say if Odin promised Atreus something that seems inarguable, then of course he would have a reason to go, but since we never hear this, we only hear bits and pieces in passing dialogue. Atreus just suddenly going to Asgard after an argument with his father just doesn't work as a plot point. Maybe I missed something, it just all suddenly happens and it was jarring. But regardless, you can still understand Atreus' frustration. He is a teenager, he just wants to rebel, he wants the opposite of his father during this moment. So. Looking at it through that lens, it can be believable. Atreus then finally drops into Asgard and let me tell you, it is beautiful. I have never seen an environment like this in any video game. The one game that comes close to this would have been the Last of Us remake, as I've said before, with other environments in this game. It's just, wow. Let's just take a moment to acknowledge the video games nowadays are becoming unbelievable. Great job, Sony Santa Monica. Atreus follows Odin's raven to the main village where all of the Aesir gods live. I am not sure what this village name is. Is it just Asgard? Like the whole thing? Like, the, like as the realm? Uh, bruh, just imagine if there was a city named Earth on Earth? Watch there actually be a city named Earth. Not <laughs> Anyways, Atreus comes across a Midgardian village of people residing in Asgard. Atreus meets a boy named Skjold... Skjold... Skjoldir? Skjold... I have no idea how to fucking pronounce that name. This golden retriever little boy is very nice. He isn't too important to the overall story until the very end, so just keep him in the back of your mind. The two talk about getting over the wall to Asgard. Skjoldir follows us to the wall and watches us climb just Cause this is something that I would do. I'm like, fuck climbing that shit, but I want to see someone else do it and see if they fall. <laughs> when Atreus gets to the top of the wall, he meets the most annoying Aesir god. What the fuck? He gives off high school bully vibes that I want to forget for the rest of my life. I mean, I 
understand this is the way his character is written, but bruh, he loves the sound of his voice. The god's name is Heimdall. Heimdall asks Atreus what part of the big ass wall does he not understand? I mean, he does have a good point, if I'm being honest. He tells Heimdall that this is his and Odin's business only, but Heimdall has none of it, of course. You can already tell at this point that Heimdall dick rides Odin. After Heimdall threatens to drop Atreus, that is when Atreus reveals why he's there. He explains that Odin would be upset if he had killed Loki of the Jotnar. After saying this, Heimdall realizes why Odin has sent him. He picks up Atreus and then go on their way. Along the way, we find out that Heimdall has the power of foresight. This means that he can see things coming that haven't even happened yet essentially making him invulnerable as long as his senses are not out of tune and not overloaded. This means he could sense what a person is intending to do, what they're thinking about, and so forth. During this whole time though, he acts all cocky and entitled. The writers did a damn good job of making the player hate Heimdall. This doesn't seem like a compliment, but it is. You'd be surprised about how hard it is to make a player slash viewer hate a character on purpose. Afterwards, we get into this not really a boss fight type thing where Heimdall is invulnerable. We pretty much get our cheeks handed to us, but all of a sudden, Thor comes out of nowhere and stands up to Heimdall. I like this sort of introduction. It really puts into perspective how the Norse gods can't stand each other. They're always ready to step on each other's necks. I also love the gash that's still in Thor's stomach from Kratos. It is there the entire game. It's just a little thing that adds to the immersion. Odin then pops into the scene. Heimdall claims that we are false and tells Odin. Odin has none of it though. Odin makes a point that of course we have false intentions considering this is our first time in Asgard. He knows none of the gods personally and not to mention Kratos and Thor fought. Also, I love the little hint of Loki being the god of mischief. Odin says, you little trickster. The tiny detail adds a lot of immersion, like I said previously. Heimdall, of course, gets frustrated on Odin's response. He dick rides Odin again, but after the conversation, Heimdall tucks his tail in between his legs and walks off. Afterwards, Odin gives us a tour of Asgard, so to speak. We first see the Valkyries and how they train. We also see Odin's army of undead soldiers that come from Valhalla. This is an interesting concept of them always coming back, kind of the same thing as the armies of hell. They can't die. Odin then gives us some books to study for some reason. Odin then mentions that we are just a guest to Asgard. We aren't serving anybody. We can come and go as we please. And this part is interesting. If Odin is such a bad guy, why is he doing this to us? Is there a wicked plan that he has? Does he have another motive for doing this? These are good questions to have and they will be answered soon. Then all of a sudden we get introduced to my... Sorry, Sif. God, Sif is such a, a bad, I, I, I mean, a good character. She's, she's, she's a good character. Sif really doesn't like us and rightfully so. I mean, Kratos literally killed two of her sons, so it makes sense. And Atreus understands this. And if you read into the codex, he states that he better keep his distance from her as much as possible. Right after we get teleported to Svartalfheim, but we come across Durlin. Durlin is a homie. He keeps the secret that we were there with Kratos. He acts as if he doesn't know us. We come back to Asgard and Odin gives us some time to explore the village. I love how they let us explore and all, but you really can't go outside from what I can tell. So this little thing was pointless. The only cool thing to come out of it was meeting Throod, who is a complex character with the same family problems as Atreus and Kratos. Like I said, Atreus and Kratos are continuously surrounded by characters that have broken family relationships. With these characters seeing these family problems, Atreus and Kratos start to understand. They understand that it is their duty to be better. They need to not fall into the trap like everyone else. Atreus then finally goes to talk to Odin in his study. We see him arguing with Hugin, his raven, for some reason. While he's doing this, we be our teenage selves and snoop around the area. Atreus eventually comes across this little sword that seems to be sentient. Then Odin comes up behind Atreus and freaks him out. Odin states that the sword's name is Ingrid. I think that's how you pronounce it. Keep in mind, this sword is going to be important later on in regards to its real owner. And you can tell that Odin is kind of keeping it prisoner considering he has it tied up against a wooden post. Although this is something little, it shows that he does these things to people or things. He's literally keeping a sword against his will and Atreus doesn't even see it. Well, maybe he does, but he doesn't comment on it. And I just find this lore in the game fascinating. Odin then brings us down in his like, basement or something. He lets us know that his drive isn't money, power, or anything of that nature. He only wants answers, knowledge, so to speak. And while playing, I made a connection. Odin states that he wants answers the same as Atreus, right? And we all know for the people that have played the game, Odin wants answers specifically to avoid his death in Ragnarok. Atreus 
literally is doing the same thing, but trying to save his father's life. And if he keeps going down that path, he may turn out like Odin. Seeing that connection really hit me, and maybe even Atreus realizes this after his time in Asgard. They are both looking for the same thing in different viewpoints. Atreus is looking to save someone else's life, while Odin is trying to save his own. Regardless, the message here is trying to go against fate is probably a bad idea. We saw that with Freya and Balder already. I'm going to let this cutscene play out. It gives details on what exactly Odin is looking for, it also reinforces the idea of what I have stated. Truth. All truth. All the answers. We could find out why we're here, learn how to change our fates, stop Ragnarok for good, maybe? Save the people we love. How? I was a young god when I found it. Spent lifetimes studying it, following every clue down every dead end, looking for and finally unearthing this. You see that? It shares the same mystical energy. It opened a crack. Can we just look inside? I wouldn't recommend that. What's the broken mask for? You recognize any writing on it? These aren't from the Nine Realms. Smolder. Obsidione Spitha. From smoldered earth and obsidian spark and a field of battles never fought. Are you certain? Because if that's the clue, I know what it means. And what's that? Keep working with me and find out. You don't have to kill anyone. You don't have to betray your father or yourself. Come on, I know you felt what I felt. The answers are in there. Let's get them. I mean, you translated this language like it was nothing. If I do help you, what's next? Thor, get down here. All oh, father. Don't do that. What's next is chasing this down. Take this and this stealthy side of beef and see where it takes you. I don't promise anything. Nonsense. Happy hunting. And you, go easy on him, you hear me? The important thing here that Odin says that catches Atreus' attention was we can change our fate. After hearing this, Atreus now has a reason to keep hanging around the Aesir. It now isn't about fooling them. As he has said before, it is now about finding a way to change fate. In Muspelheim, it is very clear that Thor doesn't trust us and he doesn't want anything to do with us. Makes sense, but during our time in this realm, all we do is try to find the missing mask piece. Nothing really happens until the end of the segment, if I'm honest. There's conversations between Thor and Loki about trust, blah, 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 blah. Atreus is trying to get through to Thor, but saying that nothing is going to happen like it should unless they both trust each other. The same conversation that he has with Kratos. It's starting to look like even more now that the main theme of the story Story, among other things, is trust. Towards the end, Atreus tricks Thor into battling in an arena of some sort. He mentions that him and Kratos have done it before, but my memory is so foggy in the last game that I can't remember. But regardless, the trick still happens, so Atreus can go visit Surtur's, the, the fire giant, his shrine. Once Atreus gets there, Angerboda literally comes out of butt ass nowhere in trust it scared the hell out of me with my headphones on even anger boda points out that atreus is easy to startle atreus connects the pieces that anger boda is looking for giant marbles actively trying to defy her destiny once again one of the main themes is presented the constant reminders sure are very blunt but when you're invested in the story they're easy to miss playing the game a second time has helped with that it gives a better understanding of the story they're trying to tell atreus mentions that after saving his that he wants to go find the rest of the giants. So you have two clear goals that Atreus wants to achieve. Both goals defy the fate that was prophesized in Angerboda's mural. I'll let the mural play out. It says a lot that's important. Who is that? Not Surtur, that's for sure. Look at all that frost. 
Sinmara. Hmm. Don't think I've heard of her before. And here comes Serta. Wow. This must have been some fight. Yeah, until it... wasn't? It just stopped? Oh, no, no, no. Look, it's because they fought together. Looks like they even became friends. Uh, good friends. Are they? Yeah, I think they are. Oh, well that's... good for them. But it looks like their... um... love caused them to combine into some kind of huge creature. Ragnarok. And then... Ragnarok destroys Asgard. Right. I saw that in Groa's Shrine. As we see Surtur claps some cheeks and becomes a giant, Asgard destroying monster. Now, why is this important? You'll see towards the end, things play out just a tiny bit differently, playing into the fact that said destiny is able to be rewritten. Afterwards, we meet back up with Thor and let the mask lead us to our objective. When we get back to where it takes us, it's by some lava, the mask brings up another mask piece. Atreus tries to not let go of the mask, but when it connects, the dude drops it in the lava and just casually puts his hand in the lava to get the mask. I guess being a god comes with being invulnerable to melting off your hand, but who, you know, who would have thought? Thor takes us back to Asgard to meet back up with the Allfucker. He claims that the rift got brighter when the mask piece is connected, and since the mask connected, Atreus says he can now read the full sentences. After, you start to witness some family problems again. Thor mentions Baldur, which causes Odin to frown, and he's charismatically intimidating, if that makes sense. Whoever acted for Odin is just doing an amazing job. Going off, seeing all of these problems with other characters, they pull it off well. It never gets to a point where you get irritated. The only time you get irritated is when you know another character's point of view is the right one. This isn't necessarily a story problem either, it's just a tool to understand a character's feelings and thoughts during a conversation. For example, when Thor just mentioned Baldur, saying that Baldur and Odin made a good team in a sarcastic way, you very much sigh with Thor rather than Odin because clearly Clearly, Odin didn't really care about Baldur. You were irritated with Odin because of his lack of care. This helps with identifying him as a villain. But on the other hand, you have Kratos. You get irritated with him because he is over caring, causing Atreus to become rebellious and bold. There is very much a stark contrast between the protagonist and the antagonist. When Thor leaves, Atreus and Odin talk a bit more. Atreus gives a scroll back to Odin and says that he had a change of heart. He realizes now that he doesn't want to be a spy. He wants to help Odin. Why is this? Well, if you remember earlier, after Odin mentioned avoiding fate, Atreus took that to heart. He now wants to know the same knowledge as Odin. I love how they took these two different characters, good and bad, and tried to make them similar. It is a hard task to accomplish, but it worked pretty well. Atreus then makes his way to his room. He takes one last final look at the mask. He puts his knife down, and a smooth transition happens where we go to Kratos' point of view. You can see the man is clearly worried about his son. He walks out of the room and makes his way toward Freya. He starts talking about the Norns, the holders of fate within the Norse realms. He asks Freya, since she was the one that sought them out regarding Baldur, could she do it again? She says that she possibly could, but it may not lead to anything. But Kratos interjects, who would want to know what they know, though Freya says they may not be cooperative. Literally, no one is cooperative in this game, so <laughs> it doesn't matter. She claims that the Norns are in Midgard, but even if Kratos knows that he is in Asgard, there's no way to get him back without an army. Now, it is clear that Freya just wants war at this point, but rightfully so. But this butts heads with Kratos. He wants the exact opposite. He wants to avoid war at all costs, considering it will possibly be his last fight if the prophecy does become true. But Tyr comes out of the darkness and explains that war will not improve any situation. He is right, but still, Tyr just seems off. He is the literal god of war. Tyr claims that Atreus will be fine, and they give him some time. Bitch, what? Everyone knows how dangerous it is to be around Odin, and this guy says that? At this point, I just distrust Tyr completely. I guarantee you he would never say such a thing. Kratos then gets mad at him, thank fucking God, and says that he isn't free of blame. He is the one that literally caused the whole mess in the first place by putting champion in his mind. But afterwards, Tyr gets a little angry at Freya, saying that it is isn't like her to have a war as a first resort. Yeah, fuck you, Tyr. That, that's all I'm gonna say. Kratos then seeks the knowledge of Mimir. Kratos asks him why he's quiet, saying that 
it isn't like him to seek out fate, but he says that Kratos' instincts haven't let them down, so they should seek out the Norns. Kratos, Mimir, and Freya then go off to Midgard. And once we get there, Kratos and Freya talk about the mural that Kratos found on his last journey with Atreus, talking in depth about his death prophecy. I want to let this play out because Kratos says one of the most badass one-liners ever in video game history. Giants, they herself had foreseen our entire journey long ago. Who we would meet, who we would fight, all of it as it happened. But you aren't dead. That image was from a time yet to come. I see. You've never struck me as someone who fears death. That's not a problem, is it? No. Death can have me when it earns me. Death can have me when it earns me. The amount of goosebumps that went over my body when he says this, Kratos is just so badass. He's the pinnacle. I mean, it makes sense once you think about it. Kratos has defied death countless times. Going back in time to kill Zeus and shit, it is almost like Kratos can never truly die. Maybe that is the real curse he talked about in the previous game. Something to think about. We finally get to where the Norns reside after three times of trying to fucking find them. But I love how Mimir makes a joke about this saying it's always on the third try or something along those lines. Little fourth wall breaks like these are just really welcome. The developers know this is always a tactic in video games to dry out game time. Usually I wouldn't like this fact, but because the gameplay is so fun, I don't mind it. The Norns talk to us by calling out each character's background. For Kratos, they mention that he's the destroyer of fate, Bane of Olympus, and bringer of war. They also mention that he cannot change. Now this happens two other times with Freya in the mirror. They call her Witch of the Woods, Queen of the Valkyries, and Frigg of Asgard. That she also can't change. Now Mimir's is pretty funny since she just talks back to them. <laughs> they say he is the Counselor of Kings, Merry Wanderer of the Woods, and, and so forth. And of course he cannot change. Mimir makes fun of this too. He interrupts them by saying, yeah, yeah, I cannot change, this and that, whatever. He's also a smart eyes, and he says that they forgot to mention he's the smartest man alive. I love him so much. I also love the writing here. They delve into each character's past. Hearing Kratos' past is very much a nostalgia moment and I'm here for it. Afterwards, we go through this nightmare stream sequence hallucination part where enemies just come barreling towards us while at the same time, the Nords are giving us images of the worst possible outcome for every character situation. I found this to be cool. Storytelling mixed in with this combat is a nice mechanic I never thought I'd like. When we get through the combat sequence, we come across a horse that apparently can walk on water Jesus style, and also they can swim underwater. Mythology is just weird. We finally get to Norns. They're these creepy creatures that don't seem to be human-like. Kratos, Freya, and Mimir's head enter the home of the Norns, tentatively. They have finally reached their destination. Kratos speaks first. I, I seek, seek my, my son! son. <laughs> You know the child is an Asgard. No, you see what all who search for us see. To know the ending to your story. The ghost of Sparta furrows his brow menacingly. He resists the urge to grunt. Oh, he fails. You come to us, piteous archetypes, seeking freedom from your scripts, as if knowing your lines would grant you the power to rewrite them. Speak plain. <laughs> you will die, Kratos of Sparta. But you, but called, you called him the destroyer, destroyer of, of fate. fate. There, there must, must be a way to subvert destiny. destiny. There is no destiny, Park. Protagonists are speechless. They do not understand. There is no grand design, no script. Only the choices you make. That your choices are so predictable, merely make us seem prescient. When, when my son, son was born, born shut up! up! <laughs> you, 
Your prophecy said he would die a needless death, and he did. Because you could not let him go. Because he thirsted for revenge. And because you kill gods. But what Kratos did, it was not out of hate. Should I bring him a crown then? He still slays gods, but now he's sad about it? You are the sum of your choices, nothing more. And because your choices never change, you will learn that Heimdall intends to kill your son in Asgard, and you will do what you do best. And then Ragnarok. The skies burn, the curtains fall. Exunt omni. Heimdall. <laughs> Again, he misses the point. Focusing on the second act to the exclusion of the final. A common mistake in Storycraft. We are, we are leaving. leaving. He stomps away, followed closely by Freya. I enjoyed your story. Crazy. What I found so interesting about this cutscene was when the Norns said, you are the sum of your choices. There is a hidden meaning here. Like they have said, there is no script written. This means that prophecy only comes true when you never change your choices. They state that the character's choices are so predictable, it is easy to understand their fate or the fate of someone else. If Kratos doesn't change, as in killing gods, then yeah, Atreus will die. So what is the said hidden meaning? It is Atreus. If Kratos doesn't change his actions with Atreus, then shit is going to happen, such as Heimdall killing Atreus, considering Atreus most likely won't want to be around Kratos anymore. It all falls on their relationship, but as you can see with Kratos at the moment, he is too focused on Heimdall killing a god, the exact point the Norns were trying to make. He is too focused on saving a son by killing the person intending to kill him, rather than saving a son by the means of being honest, open, and willing to hear. Understanding this puzzle that the Norns were trying to make just makes the story 10 times better. I'm so in love with it. After emerging from the water, the trio come across a special noose that Odin tried to off himself with. Freya says that this is an object significant to Odin. Maybe she will have use for it later. Mimir then pops the question of how Kratos is going to kill Heimdall and if he even considers it. But Kratos says that he will do what he must. Once again, Kratos is missing the point of what the Norns are saying. And later on, Mimir also points out that Kratos could possibly be misinterpreting what the Norns are saying, running headfirst into danger to protect loved ones. Kratos says that he won't change though. The exact fucking thing the Norns are saying. You can clearly tell that the developers are intending some character development in some form or another, and I'm loving it so far. And later on, other conversations play out with Mimir and Kratos. Kratos says that there has been many times where people have fulfilled prophecy by attempting to avoid it. It makes sense but he goes on. Kratos says that if Heimdall must die for Atreus to live, then he still should die because it is Kratos' nature, and Mimir agrees with this. Still, I think they're all missing the point. I mean, of course, kill Heimdall when the time presents itself in order to be safe, but I still believe the focus the Norns were trying to make was if Kratos keeps making the decision he's had with Atreus, then he will put Atreus in a position of danger. They were making the point that Kratos needs to change his nature in order to save his loved ones. His act Actions are what causes the consequences. Once we get inside Sindri's house, Kratos tells the dwarves that Heimdall intends to kill Atreus. Of course, Sindri is surprised considering that Heimdall is essentially invulnerable. So Brock gives us a clue that we need to overpopulate his senses, meaning having a weapon that we can do multiple things at once. Sindri mentions something called Dropnir. Sindri's weird ass goes and grabs Dropnir, and out of all things, it's a ring. <laughs> okay. Okay. During this whole scene though, you get to see how clumsy Sindri is and I'm here for it. I love how they added so much personality to these characters. Trace is passionate but impulsive. Kratos is stoic and intimidating. Freya is compassionate but worrisome. It makes these characters so alive. As Sindri makes his way back up, we hear Freya say that whoever has Galarhorn has the ability to start Ragnarok. Interesting. As Sindri hands over Dropnir, he mentions that they need to go see the lady. Ooh, the lady. We will see soon. As we head on our way to Svartalfheim, Sindri insists that we take him over Brock. This is a weird conversation that happens, but ultimately we choose Brock because he's very adamant about wanting to go, and Kratos decides that he should go considering he speaks blunt and plain. I always love having Brock's company, so I didn't mind too much. Throughout our journey with Freya during the beginning, she keeps giving hints on us being the champion, the same champion that Atreus thought he would be. She also keeps insisting that war is the only answer. I like a couple of things about this, 
but I also hate a couple of things. For the things I do like, I love how they're setting up these hints with us being the leader slash general, leading the war on Asgard. It isn't like it's a confirmation that we will, but it is enough of a hint to have the player thinking, what if? I also like the character world building within dialogue happening during gameplay. This has been happening throughout the entire game as well. It makes it so the player doesn't have to sit through minutes of cutscenes that could have been easily told in other means. It gives the player the ability to multitask. You'd be surprised on how much of a difference this makes in narrative storytelling. What I don't like though is how much Freya is willing to go to war. It's like she constantly says it over and over and over and over again. Like, we fucking get it. Let's, like, move on already. It feels like the writers underestimated how much the player's able to comprehend. She could have just said it once and the player would have cemented that into their minds, but she literally says it, like, five times. Once we get topside and finish the rest of the level with Brock, we come across a small dwarf village. And during this time, Brock points out that all of the residents are looking at Kratos weird. But when Mir talks to us, he explains that they were more worried about Brock being there than Kratos. This is an interesting conversation. Remember when Sindri was talking to Atreus at the beginning of the game when he was talking about how he revived Brock, but Brock lost one of his soul parts, and afterwards they were shunned out of Svartalfheim. Knowing that instance and applying it to the situation Kratos and Brock is in now, it is easy to suggest that they're frightened by Brock, probably because of his blue skin. Well, that's fucked up. Though, I do really like how they're connecting that plot point. Brock also makes some interesting points along this journey. He states that it isn't the form of the thing that matters, it is the nature that matters. Very philosophical when it comes to Brock. This point will be important later. Some funny parts play out too. Brock tells a riddle to Mimir asking what gets bigger the more you take away from it. Of all things, this will also be important later on. It is also funny that this stumps Mimir. You can't get the answer right. We then eventually get to the lady. This moment is pretty heart-wrenching, so I'm gonna let it play out. She needs the final ingredient, the blood of a god. Give her your hand. Alfie Vader almost forgot. Ma'am, it would be an honor if you might. Bless you, Force. 
Are you, uh... Hello? Hello? The fuck was that? She acts like I weren't even here. Mermaids don't speak to our corporeal bodies. They speak to a part of our soul. A part specifically you might be missing. Damn it, Sindri, you lion cat scrubber! I knew it. I died. I fucking died! The fuck you want? It needs a blessing. Yeah, well, the one to give us the blessing just fucked off into the tomb. It needs the blessing of a great blacksmith. What? No, no, I can't bless shit. I don't have all my soul bits. It, the blessing wouldn't mean squat. It is the nature of a thing that matters, not its form. All right. May this weapon strike true. May it be wielded with wisdom. May it be put down when its job is done. As we see, Brock finds out that Sindri has been lying to him. Brock doesn't have all of his soul bits, which causes the mermaid to not notice him. The important thing here is the trust and compassion that Kratos has for Brock. Brock has done so much for Atreus and Kratos, and Kratos understands this, which leads to him asking Brock for a blessing. It is not the form of the thing that matters. It is the nature of the thing. And I love this message that the game gives. It causes character development with Kratos along with Brock. Seeing the two characters connect like this brought a tear to my eye. Kratos cares deeply, even if it seems like he doesn't. Amazing. Later on, Brock gives a heart to heart with Kratos, explaining that he appreciates what Kratos did back at the forge. He says that, it is good to have friends. Remember when I said that the importance of family is the main theme of this game? And while playing the game, I have come to realize that Atreus isn't the only family. It's Brock, Sindri, Freya, literally the entire party that we got involved with. Kratos wants to protect the people he cares about. Same with Atreus. This includes everyone. What a message this game is making. They took it a step further from the last game. We then finally get to a scene with Odin. I'm gonna let this one play out because it's pretty fucking badass. Now a good time. I just want to talk. Dad to dad. Speaking of which, imagine my surprise when Atreus came knocking at my door. He's doing well, by the way, and will continue to do so just as long as I return to Asgard sometime soon. Besides, our friend here has a has a whole lot to live for. Arguable. Run along now, but behave yourself. <sighs> New spear. Never much cared for Brock. Can't deny the dwarf's talent. You came to speak. Speak. You don't really want war, do you, Kratos? All that blood on your hands on your son's hands. I want peace as much as you do. Perhaps we can find it together. He's lying. I know. That boy of ours is everything I expected. So clever, kind. You're sure he's yours? A kid. You really ought to be very proud. He is the key to peace in our age, to break free from all this fate and prophecy. My son is not your key. Oh, God, do they not have metaphor in your homeland? Or rather, did they? I'm sorry, that's not fair. I know you're not the god you once were. 
And now is your chance to prove it. Return my son, or you may meet the god I once was. And what kind of god is that, Kratos? What do you even know of godhood? In your lifetimes, has anyone ever worshipped you? Ever prayed to you? Can you even imagine that kind of love? No! You don't care about mortals. You don't care about anything beyond yourself. Beyond the monster who kills without cause. You fear what you can never even hope to understand. Is it any wonder that your boy is in no rush? Return my son, or you may meet the god I once was. I fucking love Kratos. Put your cock on the table and show him who's boss. That sounded really weird. So after seeing that scene, my testosterone levels rose. I wanted to punch a hole in my TV just because of this. The better meaning here though is Kratos of course cares about Atreus. He cares so much that he is willing to revert to his old ways in order to get him back. This is a dangerous road to walk on though. Remember what the Norns said? You will never change. If Kratos doesn't change, Atreus may get hurt. Sooner or later, Kratos is going to have to realize that. Even Odin was trying to get a rise out of him, trying to get underneath Kratos' skin in order for him to do something rash. Though I would imagine if something did happen to Atreus, I wonder how unleashed Kratos would be. It's a question for another day, I suppose. Along the way back to Sindri's house, Mimir has a couple of words with Kratos. Mimir states that Odin gives no empty threats, but Kratos has none of it. Essentially saying that he will do what he must. Kratos will be Kratos at this point. He's willing to kill a god and start Ragnarok all in order to protect his son. Trust me, I would do the same. But like I have said, Kratos is missing the point. Focus on Atreus, not Heimdall. Kratos finally gets to Sindri and Brock and shows them the weapon at Brock's request. Afterwards, Kratos asks the important question on if the two have found a way to go to Asgard, but unfortunately, they haven't. That would be too easy, of course. Kratos then asks for time to think on things, and I love this answer. It gives the time for the player to breathe, to think things through in regards to what has happened within the story. I, of course, needed it. It also shows that Kratos is tired. He just wants his son back. Seeing this is a far cry from the first three games of the series. It shows the growth of the character from the very start, and I am here for it. Kratos then goes into his room and takes off all his armor, a sign that he's tired. Not only tired of the constant step backs, but also tired of going back to his old ways. He can't escape it. It is a sad cutscene that shows a broken man, a man trying to run from his past and failing. He then looks to the bag that carried Faye's ashes, a sign that he is looking for her for help. Let me just say this though, I know you can't hear it, but the music is just amazing during the scene. Eventually, he wakes up in a dream like the other times he's fallen asleep. Faye is there to comfort him along with baby Atreus. The two get up and go on a boat. During this time, Faye talks about how she will raise Atreus, but is irritated with Kratos for not saying anything. He eventually states that he's scared for Atreus, scared that the boy will end up like him. This scene was for sure made to pull the heartstrings. My problem with this, though, is that they have already been through this in the first game regarding being scared of raising Atreus. Do they just want to reiterate it again since it is from his past? Do they just want to show how broken Kratos is? I'm not very sure. I guess the main point they were trying to get at was Kratos has an obligation to protect Atreus at all costs. That was his duty. That is what Faye wanted, so of course, he's gonna honor it. Kratos then wakes up, goes over to the wall, and starts punching it, harnessing his rage and focus. The music is so good in this scene. Oh my god. The scene then transitions to Atreus doing the same thing, saying that Kratos taught him to do so. Skjoldir is next to him just hanging out, it seems like. Peak friendship. Even though Skjoldir is and a god, Atreus still hangs with them. I find this cool. It plays into Atreus' compassionate nature. Eventually, Thrud comes into the room and talks to Atreus. She says that Odin wants to see him. Great. As we go down to Odin's sex dungeon, we hear Thor having a conversation with him. Thor explains that he doesn't like Atreus being there considering Kratos killed his sons and the fact that he is a giant. Odin then becomes a dick and starts berating Thor. Some funny stuff. What is important here is the family problems. It's all around Atreus and Kratos, teaching them to be better. I'm going to let this scene play out because it shows the difference between Kratos protecting his own and Odin protecting his self. This is where you killed Amir, isn't it? First giant. Tell me, can you murder a landslide? Smother a storm? It was more, a force of nature, a vessel of power. I was young, foolish, 
So an opportunity to create something more. I know you think it's cruel, but I did what I had to to protect my own. Why build your house here? What's in there? I'm gonna trust shh, you. Shh, shh. I'm trying to tell you. In the wake of Amir's death, I saw something, the rift, possibly the birthplace of reality. I looked inside and something was there looking back at me. It whispered to me things I couldn't possibly comprehend, but I knew they were true. When it blinded me, I thought it was over that I'd never see inside again. And then I found this. And I knew that it would finally let me see the answers. You see, son, I don't know where I go when I go. There's no Valhalla for me. Ragnarok cannot be the end. I need to know there's something more than this. I need to know what happens to me. And that's the truth, I swear, on my last good eye. That's the truth. The writing on here talks about a cold breath. Breath. Wind. It's gotta be Helheim. Helheim, you say? I'll take it. And I know just the person to accompany you. I'm trusting you two can handle this responsibility. You can count on us. Don't mess this up for me. Oh, I uh, forgot to mention. Heimdall will be joining you. What a privilege. Gotta love that we have to spend time with Heimdall. <laughs> Fuck that, dude. Jesus. Regardless, I like this scene just because you could see Odin is lying through his teeth about protecting his own. The actor did an amazing job. Along the way with Throod, the, the two only talk about Throod wanting to be a Valkyrie and about how she doesn't believe that Odin's a bad person. So from now on until we get close to the end, though, I'm going to focus primarily on cutscenes. I'm already on, like, page 30 of the script and my fingers are getting hella tired. Uh, plus, I don't think you guys want to sit through a video that's, like, four hours long, unless you do and want me to suffer. And if that is you, I really hate you. <laughs> Watch this still be three hours though, fucking Christ. The two eventually get to a large wolf that is chained to the ground, probably meaning that there's a good reason why it's locked up there. Atreus has the bright idea of releasing the thing because he's compassionate toward animals. Atreus ends up freeing it and wanders off to the depths of hell. I can't imagine this is going to have a good outcome in all honesty. The mass then leads Atreus and through to a dead end. The mass stops glowing, meaning that nothing is there, and I have a problem with this. If there was nothing there in the first place, why would it just be glowing before? It just seems like a ploy in order for the player in Atreus to believe something is actually there. There's no explanation in the game that indicates why the thing should be reacting at all. It just seems like they needed a section where Atreus messes up somehow, and sure, the scene works to an extent, but there could have been other ways to do so. As the two start to leave, they eventually make their way to a place where they can see claw marks hovering in the air. Heimdall comes and runs his mouth by saying, we had freed a beast that can tear through realms. Heimdall then becomes mythology racist and goes off on everyone, including Throod, who was defending us. Now, why was she defending us? Wasn't she just mad at us? I guess she hates Heimdall too, so I, it makes sense. Heimdall then starts talking shit about Throod's dad, Thor, saying he isn't scared of him at all. But in reality, when we first came to Asgard, he was most certainly scared of Thor, so the dude is just acting like a normal high school bully. I do wish there was more depth with Heimdall, though. His only personality trait is being an asshole, which sucks. Thrud and Heimdall start fighting, and she gets her ass handed to her, obviously, and afterwards we get transported to Asgard again. After Thrud gets done hounding Atreus's ass, he goes to his room to rethink everything he has done. Odin comes into Atreus's room to talk about his mistake. He wants to hear from Atreus rather than Heimdall, and of course, Atreus tells him. Odin oddly tells Atreus that we all make mistakes, even though Atreus casually just let hell loose across the realms. Atreus then says he now wants to go home, but Odin says that he needs to leave the stuff he gave him behind. And I like this scene a lot because of how off-putting Odin is. He seems so friendly, but 
we all know deep down that he has other sinister plans. Ronan explains that just because we messed up doesn't mean that he isn't welcome in Asgard. Atreus makes it back to Midgard and goes through the portal. When Atreus makes it back to Sindri's house, he sees that Hellwalkers are just all over the place. He starts to help Freya while Kratos comes out and just annihilates everything in sight. And a cutscene plays that is truly remarkable. Hold still. I told you I'm fine. Oh, you're bleeding. Quit your blubbering. It's all my fault. The Hellwalkers, they're everywhere. Everywhere. That is not your fault. Yes, it is. There was a wolf in hell. He was in chains and, and I set him free. I, I thought that if- Garm! Great bleeding fuck lad, you freed Garm! Garm? Who freed Garm? That's madness. Surely not you, young one. If the Hound of Hell is loose, he'll chew through the fabric of the realms. Hellwalkers are just the beginning. What were you thinking? Aye, this is a fuck-up of not insignificant proportions. What would drive you to such mischief? Is this Loki's doing? Enough. Leave him. Atreus has made a mistake. One that we will fix together. Grand. Now, if you don't mind, I'd rather stay here. I've had my fill of visits to Helheim. As you can see, Kratos has accepted that Atreus has made a mistake and is more than willing to help him. I like it so much because everyone starts to gang up on Atreus, saying that it was a huge fuck up, but Kratos stops them. He starts to understand now that the most important thing now is to keep Atreus safe and to have a better relationship with him. That way, no more harm will be done with anything. And at this point, I really think he's starting to understand what the Norns were saying. Not to mention the scene is emotional. You never get to see Kratos hug someone. like. Ever. Regardless, we make it to hell again, but this time the dialogue gets a bit different. While fighting enemies and doing God of War shit, Kratos and Atreus talk deeply about trust. For one, they start to understand each other, stating that everyone has secrets, even Kratos, and sometimes it's best to have secrets in order to protect the ones we care about. He has a point there. Atreus continues to inform Kratos about his adventures while he was in Asgard. He mentions the glowing mask that he's been carrying around deciphering for Odin. He states that it has some sort of importance to Odin. Atreus states that the whole situation is complicated though, just like Kratos' reasoning for carrying a new weapon. This whole section is about letting go what is close to your heart and understanding that the important things are right in front of you. This includes parenthood and understanding a parent. I really like this section mostly because it is family bonding time. I swear I don't have dad issues. Atreus then lets out a huge sentence that explains that he doesn't want to be alone anymore. He liked having friends his age in Asgard, and after hearing this, Kratos understands and feels sorry. Later on, Kratos explains that he doesn't want Atreus to feel alone, that Atreus' decision to go to Asgard helped them understand what he has to do in order to be a better parent, per se. Atreus states that even though he knows not to trust Odin, he needed them to help better understand the situation at hand in order to avoid Ragnarok. And this whole section is just very emotional. At every turn in the level, you hear dialogue that helps better explain their family situation and I am here for it. Once again, the section made me tear up. We eventually get to a boss fight that isn't entirely too eventful. We pretty much take down the wolf, but he revives himself anyways, making the boss fight entirely redundant, so I'll skip ahead. The important thing to mention though is that Atreus doesn't want to kill the beast, but Kratos says that there really is no other way to stop this thing. But of course, since the beast can't 
die. This point really doesn't matter. Later, Kratos spills the beans about Heimdall, about how he intended to kill Atreus, which is why he crafted the new weapon. But then we are interrupted because the wolf tries to kill us, initiating a running away sequence. I will say that the developers did a great job at intensifying the situation. I had my heart racing trying to get away from the beast. We then fought the wolf a second time. The boss fight again is nothing spectacular. You just aim your spear at the highlighted parts of the body and blow it up, making the wolf vulnerable for a bit, which you can press RT and R be repeatedly. Atreus then has a plan to get onto the beast and stab it with his knife occupied with a soul. I don't think I mentioned this earlier, but I think I did. Fenrir is in Atreus's knife, so as you can predict, Fenrir comes back and looks like his actual mythology counterpart. After defeating the beast along the way, we hear some more important dialogue that talks about Kratos' death and how he saw it on top of a mountain in Jotunheim. Atreus understands now that this is why Kratos has been training him so hard. Atreus needs to be able to survive on his own when Kratos eventually surely doesn't live anymore. Yeah, this scene is pretty heartfelt and made me have goosebumps all over my body because of it. Afterwards, some heartfelt scenes play out. You're okay. Sorry I hurt you. It's over now. I promise. Ben? Are you? Giant magic. I've been learning things. In Asgard. This has nothing to do with that. More secrets. No. A promise. When that someone's trusting me to keep. Like you kept your promise to mom? See what I can do when you trust me? I love how Fenrir just looks like a huge ass fucking fuzzball. I love him so much. The important thing though is that Atreus makes an important point about trust. Someone trusts him to keep a secret, just like Faye did with Kratos. And at this moment, Kratos then finally understands and is a pivotal moment to a story arc. Though I do wish there was a blunter nature to it, the scene still gets his point across and I'm happy with it. After the scene, Atreus points out that Kratos doesn't want to be a god killer anymore, that he doesn't want war, but Kratos says that he will do what he must in order to keep him safe, solidifying the fact that he cares for Atreus so much that he's willing to revert to his old self. I don't know if I like this answer considering we spent so much time with Kratos and witnessed his character change in the last game, but later his thinking does change back. You will see soon. Yet I do wish there wasn't so much flip-flopping on decisions in this game. Eventually we get to an extremely important scene. Let me show you. What's wrong? Falling back into my old ways. Angry. Distrustful. With you. Now and before. I. I chased you away. Without you, I got reckless, overconfident, made stupid mistakes. I don't know why I thought I could do this alone. You were right. No. Warrior, 
worthy of your namesake. I was the one who was not ready. You don't have to be who you were just because I'm not there. Let's make a promise. I'll listen for your voice in my head when you're not there to guide me. And you do the same. All right? I need to know you'll be okay without me. Don't be sorry, Father. Be better. <laughs> Let's go home. As you can see, Atreus literally is Kratos' rock, his anchor. Whenever Atreus isn't around, this is when Kratos doesn't know what to do. He goes back to his old ways. But this important sequence of telling the truth really put into perspective how wrong Kratos was. He shouldn't have chased away Atreus in the name of not trusting. He should have talked it out with him and tried to understand why he's acting the way he is. And at this point, I really do think the shift happens with Kratos' character. He doesn't want to go after Heimdall anymore. He just wants his son. He wants his son to be a better person, and because of that he wants to be a better role model. Of course, if the situation arises where Heimdall needs to be killed, he will do so, but he isn't going to hunt him down like he did with other gods before. I don't know, the scene in my opinion was just handled really well. Afterwards, Atreus shows the group all that he has learned while he was in Asgard. He brings out his notebook and shows everyone what the mask looks like and tells the importance it has to Odin. Everyone kind of brushes it off and I don't know why. Literally, the person who has just recently been in Asgard tells you it's important and Odin is infatuated by it and you just brush him off. It makes no sense to me, but when we show it to Tyr, he goes into depth about it, which is interesting. He says that this is the reason they tortured him. Is no one going to question why this dude has every answer in the book, but when it comes to fighting, he's a giant pussy even though he's the god of war? It's ridiculous. Better writing could have been done in order to hide the eventual plot twist that is gonna happen, in my opinion. Freya then asks if Heimdall is still their focus, but Kratos says that they will rewrite their fate another way. She says that she will go to Vanaheim to help her brother. Atreus and Kratos let her go. Like I said, Kratos now understands that going after Heimdall is something he shouldn't do, but when the opportunity comes to him, then he should act. When Atreus gets back to the Sindri's house, he takes a moment to apologize to everyone regarding the way he acted when he left. Mostly everyone forgives him except Sindri, but Sindri forgives him in his own way. Tyr also says a statement that he'll pick up a spear next time something happens, but I fucking highly doubt that. When we go through the portal in order to get to Vanaheim and try to find Freya, Atreus asks what exactly happened in order for Freya to come back and forgive us. Kratos explains vaguely how it happened, telling him that he helped free her from Odin's clutches, and I like how they included this bit of dialogue within gameplay. Having it drawn out in a cutscene would feel out of place in my opinion, and I'm glad they went with this option. Kratos, Mimir, and Atreus finally get to the Vanaheim camp, but when they get there, there's no one in sight, indicating that either they're off doing something or that they are in danger. Either way, the three will need to go find them. But all of a sudden, the three hear a sound and someone emerges that they don't know. They all talk for a period of time. Mimir talks and it seems like he has a history with the stranger, though soon after he reveals himself to be the boar that we had hurt in the first game, if you guys don't remember. His name is Hildas Vini. When Atreus recognizes this, he immediately apologizes for what he did, but Hildas Vini brushes it off 
off and says not to worry. Later on, you will come to find that it seems as if this man was just shoved into the game last minute. It would have been a lot better if he was introduced in the last of Anaheim section. Then when we came back, that is when Atreus can meet him and be surprised. The character growth with him could have been a lot better. Hillisvini tells us that the moon has been stolen from Skull and Haunty, that we need to fetch it back and bring the realm to what it was, and of course, the trio agree. After that, they will then need to find Freya and Freyr since it was revealed to us that the crew all went to find Freyr since he was captured, I guess. Later on, Atreus asked the question of, if giving back the moon to the wolves will officially start Ragnarok, since it was foretold in the prophecy, but Mir quickly shuts this down by saying that it was only foretold, and since visiting the Norns, they had enough with that word. Now, this is when you really start to notice the character changes with everyone. From what I could tell, Mimir was mostly siding with Atreus when it came to prophecy, and kind of still does, but ever since visiting the Norns, he is now hesitant to agree. Maybe that's because of the reveal that the Norns stated, where they said there's no destiny, only choice, but I may be wrong. Atreus then says that maybe this is why Odin's forces stole the moon, to avoid Ragnarok or prepare for it by distracting people. And after some time chasing down this annoying as fuck enemy that was holding the moon, we finally retrieve it and bring it back to the wolves. Throughout the journey, we see Atreus question himself on what to do next, whether to give the moon to the wolves and fulfill prophecy, or totally disregard the realm in the sake of making prophecy not become true. And this conversation is quite interesting because throughout the game, you're reminded that you can write your own fate, but does that mean you need to always do the opposite of what fate has foretold? It's a very interesting interesting concept, and Kratos brings up a good point though. Why would you turn your back on things in the name of only avoiding the fate foretold? You do things in the name of good for people and the world. It is silly to worry about what and what not to do when destiny is involved. But eventually, Atreus places the moon back where it belongs, and when he does this, it wakes up the wolves. They sit down at the edge of the cliff, awaiting the arrow that is shot. Atreus, still contemplating on what to do, stops before shooting the arrow. Kratos then tells Atreus that fate will only bind you if you let it. A perfect sentence to encapsulate the situation. Taking that to heart, Atreus shoots the arrow, making the realm back to what it was. Mimir also sees that it was a good choice, and after, the wolves leave behind some sort of object that calls them to change the time of day in the realm. This is mostly used as a device for puzzles in the game though, so it isn't that important. We eventually get back to camp and Fran meets us there. She isn't harmed. She asks Kratos that the eclipse was the trio's doing, and of course they agree. She tells us that the eclipse was the diversion for them to escape, and doing so, they found out where they're holding Freyr. It is now our time to break him out. To be honest, I do wish we spent a little more time with Freya in this game. I want to get close to him. It just feels like we are breaking him out for the sake of Freya, which of course makes sense, don't get me wrong, but what about the player's reasoning? Players want to reason given why they should even care about him. A way of trying to avoid this would be maybe playing alongside him in the last Vanaheim level. Yes, I, it would have drawn out the game a tad bit longer, but with that comes more character development. You'll start to find throughout the last bit of the game that characters start to become unimportant to you, and you will see why later. Kratos then tells Atreus to go with Hilda's Vini, while Kratos goes with Freya. And after a long-ass section of taking out Odin's forces and talking with Freya, we hit a cutscene. Freya gets this little weak-ass firework gun and explodes in the air, signaling to everyone else that we're at the designated spot. And as we do so, bitch-ass Heimdall comes out. And yes, we finally get to end his annoying, small dick bitch ass. When we meet him, all he does is just talk shit. That's it. Solidifying to Kratos in the player that his ashes needs to, like, die. So Freya tells us that we know what needs to be done, and she heads her way out to meet up with the others, leaving us with the boss fight that I've been waiting for. And in all honesty, this boss fight was like hella easy. You pretty much just fight with your spear and explode it whenever he gets nearby. And after the quick time events, that is when you can hit him like a normal enemy. It's different for sure, but it isn't difficult. But we eventually kick his ass and the cutscene plays. Fuck! That's all this is! Oh, no, 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 no. You are going to spare me out of pity! <laughs> Let it go, you may live. Is this about the little runt? Oh, now I am definitely going to gut him! <laughs> <laughs> This is your final warning. I don't think a warning is going to cut it. 
You think you get to just walk away? No. That is not how this works. <laughs> You do not get to decide my fate! You are dead, sunshine. After fighting him again because his cocky ass won't give up, we absolutely open up a can of whoop ass and unleash the old god of war. <laughs> Kratos, that was just... Uh, I don't know if we are breaking fate, or fate's breaking us. Mimir looks horrified at what Kratos did, and for good reason. Mimir has never truly seen what Kratos is really capable of, even after witnessing him defeat Baldur. He even states that he doesn't know if we are breaking fate or if it is breaking us, and after trying to decipher the message, it makes sense. Kratos has a revelation with Atreus that he wouldn't go after Heimdall because he knew it wasn't important. Kratos also gives Heimdall a chance to live as well. Because of those actions with Kratos, fate has given him the option of truly killing him, ending the danger that Atreus was in. I guess what I'm trying to say is, after following what the Norn stated in some way, shape, or form, fate was broken. But at the same time, he still is a monster, a god killer, as they also have stated. It is his nature to kill gods, yes, but that option has opened up because of his open heart nature to Atreus. Doing so as he did, avoided the death of his son, rather than having a son killed and then killing Heimdall. All of this is really fucking confusing, but still makes sense. So it's a plus in my book. We then get to the position of Freya and Freyr and the rest of the group. We take out some enemies and after, carry Freyr to safety with some badass looking visuals of Kratos going like 100 miles per hour while at the same time kicking some ass. I wish we could do this in gameplay, but I understand why we can't. Freyr tells us to throw this little blue thing into the water and when we do so, the blue thing turns into a boat. Bruh, if this wasn't a mystical fantasy game, I would be screaming at my screen right now. Imagine just keystring a boat. <laughs> Freyr has some explaining to do. And as we ride the boat, Kratos and Atreus get scared because it looks like we're gonna go off a waterfall. And then all of a sudden we start flying. Bruh. <laughs> Freyr even laughs at us, fucking dick. After all of the hype is over, we start getting attacked by these giant ass dragon-like creatures. Everyone starts defending the boat and then all of a sudden this random ass dude sacrifices himself to save everyone. A noble feat, but I have some problems with this. They made this whole scene so dramatic when we barely know the dude. I've only heard him say a couple of lines within the game. Normally I wouldn't care if this was in the game, if it wasn't as dramatic as it was. But because it is, they made it seem like this heartfelt thing. But the player doesn't care. We never got close with this character. We have only heard him say a couple of lines. And to be honest, I only learned his name after the side quest. The scene just didn't vibe with me, and it would have been better if we just made it safely back to camp with no one getting hurt. But on the bright side though, if you follow the side quest like I stated, it leads you to this cool ass open area. You find that the dude actually is alive and you can save him. So I understand why they did this to open up the said side quest quest, but they could have done this in another way. We eventually get Freyr to ground and Lunda heals him up. Dialogue was kind of funny here considering Freyr gets high off Vanir magic like it's morphine. Freyr also is nice enough to give us his boat. This boat is only used for like the side quest, I think. I may be mistaken though. Afterwards, everyone then goes back to Sindri's house. When we get into the portal, Atreus tells us about Galarhorn. He says that if the horn is sounded by a god, it opens up all of the nine realms, so to speak. This essentially indicates that Kratos will blow it at some point. Wait, 
pause. Jesus Christ. Amir states that this sounds like some vulnerability and asks why it was never destroyed, but Kratos responds by saying some objects defy destruction. This is a callback to the Blades of Chaos, where Kratos tried to throw them away, destroy them, and so forth, but every time he tried, they always came back to him. So, since Gatherhorn can't be destroyed, someone had to look after it at all times. When we get back to Sindri's house, Kratos shows everyone the horn. When he does this, literally everyone knows what happens next. Ragnarok. Tyr then comes into the picture and looks surprised and horrified about this news, which is a cause for concern. You'll see why later. He says that there is no stopping Ragnarok now. After, Atreus then brings up the mask again. He states that the knowledge held with the mask is what Odin cares about the most. And after saying this, Atreus asks to go back to Asgard, but Kratos has a tone in his voice that makes it seem like he doesn't want him to go. Atreus states that if he gets some answers while he is over there, it can maybe get them out of Ragnarok. While Kratos thinks about this situation, Atreus asks for the knowledge of Mimir. He asks him for a tactical standpoint if this is a good idea. Mimir states that he doesn't necessarily like the idea, but it is their best option. He says that it could possibly buy them time considering Odin will have to be at two places at once, and this makes sense. Yet at the same time, you can clearly see the turmoil that is going through Kratos' mind. He just got his son back, but now has to let him go back again? But this is a time where he can finally trust Atreus and win him over, which is exactly what he does, and I love it. Seeing Kratos' character development throughout this game was an amazing sight. From yelling at his son because of the lack of trust, till now, seeing him willingly let his son go because he is the person he trusts the most? Peak storytelling. Kratos then tells Atreus to remember their promise. This thing made me cry, man, I'm not gonna lie. And when Atreus makes his way back to the portal, Sindri meets him there, giving him a certain power that whenever he's in a tough situation, he's to say a certain word and stomp hard. And when he does, he will then be transported somewhere safe. And when we get back to the old house, Fenrir and Anger Boda surprise us. And after some talking, she gives us another one of those marbles that hold giant souls. It also happens to be Atreus's marble. Loki's marble. Anger Boda then asks us where we're heading off to. Atreus tells her the truth by saying that he's going to go to Asgard, but she seems super worried about this. But Atreus calms her down by saying that there's a reason for doing this. Atreus asks if she has faith in him, and of course he says yes, but also asks if this is the destiny that he truly wants written. A very intriguing question that resonates with Atreus, and I love how this game always gives you this question. It cements it in the player's mind in a good way. It makes you question what the characters are doing at all times, seeing if they're making decisions that you would make. Regardless, Treus asks Angerboat if she can watch over Fenrir, and she agrees to do so. And afterwards, we get transported to Asgard, and as soon as we get there, Odin tells us that Heimdall is dead and asks if we know anything about it. And Atreus, harnessing his panic, like Kratos taught him, hides his eye well by saying that he doesn't know. What has me concerned, though, is how does he know so quick? I mean, I understand that he's Odin, so he knows more than most, but still. Regardless, Atreus tells Odin that he has now deciphered the writing, and apparently the mask piece is somewhere in Niflheim. Odin tells us that we need Thor for this mission and tells us to find him. I wish during this part that we could just speed it up just a tad bit. The beginning of Ragnarok missions are starting to drag hard, and it shows. Though I do understand why they need to have us find Thor in this level, because it needs to show us important themes that have been spread out through this game. My point still stands, though. Let me know if you agree. Atreus then eventually meets up with Thrud. Atreus asks where Thor might be since we don't know where he is. She tells us that she might know. After this, I will say some combat sequences play out that are fun where there's a bar fight. Though there were some points where I just wish there was just a cutscene instead. I just feel like they were padding out game time hella. It was sort of a story lull moment, so to speak. I'm not necessarily saying this it was a bad thing because I guarantee you that there are people that love these sequences. But for me, at least they loaded the Heimdall section so much to the point where right after it feels so dull. I know you have to have a story dip right before the climax happens, which is near, but still. I wish this section could have been done quicker. We finally meet Thor at the bar where, of course, he is. He's a drunk. Atreus tries to get his attention, but Thrud interrupts by essentially saying that Thor is fucking up. He made a promise to his family by not drinking and acting up. Thor ignores the entire thing, while at the same time yelling at Atreus for bringing her here. And during this whole scene, some dumb Einherjar messes with Atreus, and that's what brings us to the bar fight. After the whole bar fight section, Thor literally collapses because he drank too much. When that happens, Atreus and Thrud pick him up and take him outside. Thor? Get up. Ah, Thrudy. 
You are going to Niflheim with Loki. All father's orders. You have to get up. I know you're disappointed. Disappointed? No, 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 no. That was a glorious fight. You can't even say you're sorry this time, can you? Because what's one more broken promise? Grandfather treated you like crap. You were struggling. I get it. But you can't just... We're here for you. Mom and I are here for you. Even when you're here. We love you. You know that. I just thought this was behind us. I fucked up. Get you a water or something? Fine. You again. I like this scene a lot because of the contrast between Kratos and Thor. And as you see, Thor is doing the exact opposite of Kratos. Thor, knowing that he's doing what he's doing is hurting his family, still decides to drink because for one, Odin says he's better that way, but Two, you can see there's pain that he wants to forget. With Kratos, he tries to correct his mistakes with Treus by trusting him, being there for him, and not fucking up. Not to mention, he also faces his problems head on because in the past, he has learned that running away from your problems never works. These things will come into play at the end of the game, and I will elaborate on them when the time comes. And when we get to Niflheim, we do the same thing that has been done with the Muspelheim level, where you pull out the mask to find the direction of the next piece. While this is happening, Atreus will briefly have conversations with Thor about parenting, what it's like being the son of a hard-ass authoritarian god. Atreus tries to get through to Thor and almost succeeds a couple of times, but Thor doesn't really have any of it. We eventually get to the last mask piece, and Thor then tries to get the mask, but right in the middle of doing so, Odin appears, somehow knowing that we have retrieved the mask piece. Then, again, another person comes out of nowhere, Mommy Sif. Odin, confused, asks why she's here, and Sif starts to complain as to why Atreus is working with Odin, concerning we are the ones that helped Kratos kill her son. And as you can see, doubt is starting to rise with everyone. The important thing though is they're starting to distrust Odin. This is very much a signal that Ragnarok is on the verge of happening. Sif then goes over to Thor and talks to him about Magni and Modi and how they have died by the hands of Atreus and Kratos, but also Odin. She's essentially telling him that he needs to stand up for his family and finally change, so to speak. And when he hears this from Sif, he changes his mind about everything and approaches Atreus threatening to kill him. As Thor does this, we hear Sindri call out to step hard on the stone in order to transport us to a safe place. And when we're teleported, Kratos was there to greet us like a good father. He picks up Atreus with the mask in his hand, and there's a brief conversation that is had where Atreus pretty much says that it was his last time in Asgard helping the Aesir. Atreus then asks why Kratos was even out in the Yggdrasil in the first place, but Mimir simply says that he was just worried about Atreus being a good dad. When we go into the treehouse, the characters talk to each other regarding what to do next with the mask in the beginning of Ragnarok. Tyr, of course, starts talking about trying to slip into Asgard quietly. Now, please tell me, Tyr, how in the absolute living fuck are we going to stealth our way into Asgard? The whole place is inhabited mostly by gods and soldiers, and you're meaning to tell me we have a chance to stealth? Stop talking. I hate this, Tyr. He also mentions in dialogue that they can gain the knowledge they need, very similar to Odin's rhetoric. I think you know where this is going. After 
towards Atreus mentions that at worst, they can gain something at leverage to use against Odin. At best, they can get the answers in order to make their own path. Well, sounds like a decent enough plan. Afterwards, Tyr goes on a long as fuck tangent about being a wussy when problems come to their door. So in order to pay that debt back, he says he's willing to sneak into Asgard. Red flags have been raised to the maximum for me on this. Tyr has done literally nothing this entire game and we're expected to just trust him to go to Asgard. Not to mention, none of us even have a way to Asgard. So we're expected to just believe he has a way in. He never told us about this. Even when Atreus was trapped in Asgard, he never spoke up and mentioned it. When he gets pressed about this, all he says is, you would have done something rash. Like, yeah, fair, but still, you're an asshole. Eventually, Brock starts pressing him in, oh dear. Brock, it's okay. No, it ain't. This ain't right. All the pieces ain't welding together true. Like, what's with him calling you Loki anyway? You know that ain't his name. Hey, I'm talking to you. You never shut up. Run. Of all the things, Odin. Let go of the boy and face me. Tell your brother to throw me the mask and you've got a deal. Stop moving. Freya, if he dies. No, no. It wasn't part of the plan. But if he dies, we are square for Heimdall. And honestly, you got a bargain. I will kill you. Plan on that. Mm -hmm. So nice spending time with you again. Freya, please. Uh, uh, uh. Can't be in two places at once. Frig. Hey, I don't move. You don't move. Don't do anything you won't regret. I regret many things. Killing you will not be one of them. Lose my son. I am in control here. Throw me the mask now. Too bad, son. Looks like war after all. Please, you have to save him. You have to. He can't. You can't. Maybe if I go back to the lake. Stop me. I know what you've done. And I forgive you. But you gotta stop. You gotta let go. This whole time. So, uh, what do we do now? Now? Now we kill Odin and anyone who gets in our way. Truth. As you can see, Brock died. When this initially happened on my first playthrough, I wasn't paying attention to how Tyr was acting or any of it. So when this surprise hit, I was genuinely surprised. Him killing Brock broke me. My favorite character is just gone like that. With the final words of Sindri being, you have to let go. And after those words hit, tears just started rolling down my face. 
You'll see later on though, Sindri doesn't let go. It took a toll on Sindri hard and I feel really bad. Now regarding my feelings about the plot twist, I loved it to be honest. It took the supposed bad writing I was stating previously and put it on its head, making that supposed bad writing intentional. The writers wanted you to question what Tyr was doing, and on the second playthrough after knowing what happens, I started to see the little hints, such as when he was in the shrine genuinely worried, him not fighting at all, and his adamant nature about not wanting to go to war with Asgard. It all just makes perfect sense. Brock's death is very much the same as like if your dog died that you loved dearly. If that makes sense, he was literally the glue to the group, the comedic relief, the wise old man, and someone who was just loyal to a T. So when he dies, you want revenge, you want justice, you want to end Odin. And after the death of Brock, Kratos tells Atreus to come with him. They're going home. And if you remember the beginning of the game, Kratos immediately told Atreus that he needed to train after the death of Fenrir. Now you see a stark character change. After the death of Brock, he's telling Atreus that he essentially needs to take time to grieve. And while they're hunting a deer to get their mind off things, Kratos repeats this by saying that this is only a distraction, that they're wounded at the moment and need time to heal. Atreus needs to heal before pushing forward. And like I said, grieving is something that is needed within this situation. After understanding this message, Atreus says that he wants to see Sindri. He believes that he's in Tyr's temple, explaining that it's the place where Brock and Sindri finally reconnected in the last game, fulfilling their family. I love this full circle that the writers did, Brock and Sindri finally getting back together at the temple, but they ultimately go their own ways in the same place. And I love the poetic moment moments within the game. It adds so much character to an already amazing story. Atreus gets to where Sindri is at the temple and tells them that he is sorry, but sorry only goes so far. During this whole section, Sindri is grieving so hard to the point where he's being a dick to everyone. He misses his brother. It's understandable. He's at a point where he can't see reason, and honestly, since it was his only family, in his eyes, I don't think he will ever be whole again. He pretty much tells Atreus in this conversation to fuck right off, that he doesn't want to see his face again. I'm actually glad that he's acting this way. Usually in games, they will have a character forgive after a lackluster sorry was made, and and in this game, Sindri is so far deep in grief that anything anyone says will result in an argument or Sindri saying, get away from me. It's heartbreaking and realistic. Atreus then gets back to Kratos and tells him that he thought they were his family, since Sindri used to use the excuse that Brock was his only family. We were his family, but he doesn't see that. Even Kratos mentions this among all people. It was just a heartbreaking scene that I appreciate. The characters and the players needed this. Real quick, I also like the character development direction of Sindri. He's the exact opposite of Kratos, or I guess the same as Kratos in his old days. The loss of family resulting in grief and then forming it into rage and revenge. It's poetic. What I found interesting though was after the death, Kratos says that this is all about revenge now, and I don't necessarily know if I like this character change or not, since I already know he will have a realization that revenge isn't the answer, the same thing he's been preaching before. So we eventually got back to the treehouse, and now it is time for Ragnarok to unfold. The people essentially talk about how Odin literally knows everything about their plan now, so sneaking in isn't going to be an option anymore. They say that the only way into Asgard is to blow Gatherhorn and enter Asgard through the temple. Seems like a solid enough plan that will play out like a damn action movie, and I can't wait. Let's fuck Odin up. After a while, everyone comes up with a plan to gather the armies, getting the armies of Hell, Vanaheim, Niflheim, and Svartalfheim, and so forth. Kratos and Atreus' job now is to find the fire giant Surtur in Muspelheim in order to make the Ragnarok monster that was seen in the mural. Sounds like a decent enough plan, so we all go on our way. And on our way there, it's this funny as fuck dialogue where Atreus feels awkward telling Kratos that the only way for Surtur to become the monster is to clap cheeks with another giant named Sinmara. I don't know, it, it's so teenager taboo talk that's hilarious. Along the way to Surtur, conversations are had about the potential persuasion of Surtur becoming Ragnarok. Atreus insinuates that possibly the only way to make this happen is to force Surtur, and even Kratos questions this. This dialogue isn't important at all, but I found its contents interesting and really makes you think how in the world are we going to be able to pull off Ragnarok? It feels like a suicide mission. Well, kind of is now that I think about it. So after refusing to help us the first time we ask, after defeating a boss fight, we finally get to talk to Surtur again without any interruptions. Surtur says that he will not help us because I guess he loves Sinmara too much. I mean, it makes sense. Love makes you not want to take risks like this. Surtur says that he doesn't want to get Sinmara involved. If you guys don't know where she is, I think she's in Niflheim. It's kind of cool because Niflheim is the cold realm and Muspelheim is the hot realm. So having Sinmara and Surtur connect means mixing hot and cold. 
Look, don't look at me like that. I just find it cool, dude. Fuck. Sodor eventually agrees to become the monster after seeing Kratos' blades. He agrees because it doesn't get Sinmaru involved. If Sodor puts his flames into Kratos' blades, they will become hot enough to stab Sinmaru's heart in Sodor and will cause Ragnarok to be born. So after hearing this, Kratos and Atreus agree, and Sodor says to follow him to the spark of the world. This is where Muspelheim and Niflheim meet the first realms that were created. When we get there, bro, it is the most fucking beautiful place literally anywhere in the game. The colors in this are so vibrant. The mixing of blue and red is astounding, truly a sight to behold in the game, and you can't help but to just stand there and take it all in. We eventually get to where Surtur pulls all of his flames into Kratos' blades. This causes enough heat to where if he stabs it into Sinmara's heart, it will cause Ragnarok, which of course he does. And when this happens, Surtur falls off a cliff and we don't hear from him, from him for a while until after this cool ass boss fight sequence. Get away from me! So fucking cool. Afterwards, we go back to where Surtur fell and he tells us that whenever we blow the horn, Ragnarok will come. And this dude is massive. The visuals in this game, I have no words. And when we get back to Mimir, he tells us that he has united the army of hell. This means we will have an unlimited army, so to speak, which is pretty cool. And after Mimir tells us this, we go on our way. While going through the portal, the trio talk about what is next regarding Ragnarok. Atreus is excited to see the realms unite against Asgard, but Kratos asks why he is so certain. Atreus claims that everything that everyone has been through, they have to unite. This makes sense and I love this revelation with Atreus. Instead of looking at this through the perspective of revenge, Revenge, Atreus looks at this through the means of justice, which is the opposite of Kratos in the moment. Atreus just wants to see the realms prosper, and to do this in memory of Brock. His character growth throughout this game was a good one, and it's sad to see this game come to a close. When we get to the temple, we see that Freya has united with the Valkyries, now shield maidens. Freya also says that the Valkyries are reborn. She also mentions that Freya has united the realm of Vanaheim, and they will fight in the war, except Sindri hasn't come back, with the news about Svartalfheim, which is worrisome. We then get to our tents. Freya mentions that Atreus can get his own bed as well, but he seems a little uneasy. As we find out, he is scared and asked to sleep in Kratos' tent. This is such a sweet moment that I can't help the smile. Kratos opened his heart to Atreus and Atreus the same way. Seeing this two grow so much over the past two games, and even more so in this game, it is enough to make a grown man cry. Atreus having trouble sleeping, Kratos tells him to calm his mind, but he says that he can't. Kratos then tells him a story in order for him to sleep. Kratos tells a story about a man who used to carry wood on his back for his people, but there was a day where he got so tired of it to the point where he asked death to come to him. If you can't tell, this is a story very similar to Kratos. Kratos had a life where he did everything for the people. Gods, the people of Sparta, Atreus. But when asked death to come to him, well, I'll follow up on this story before the Battle of Asgard. Afterwards, Kratos falls asleep and awakes in his final dream with Faye. This whole section is a preparation for Faye's eventual death, putting your yellow ass hand on trees, marking them. This whole time, Kratos talks about how scared he is when Faye leaves, about raising Atreus and what to do next, but an important line is said towards the end. When the pyre is spent, and you have gathered my ashes. Spread them from the highest peak in all the realms. You will do this for me. To grieve deeply is to have loved fully. Open your heart to the world as you have opened it to me, and you will find every reason to keep living in it.
This got me so emotional. Like the music is just so, wow. This is the best score for a game that I have ever heard in my life, no question. When Faye tells him to open his heart to the world, you'll find every reason to keep living in it. And that line was amazing. A significant character change for Kratos. He always used to tell himself in Atreus to close his heart to the world in order to feel no emotion to the pain. And when Faye says this to him in his dream, and when he wakes up with Atreus next to him, it sparks something in him. He now knows it is Atreus's nature to be kind, to open his heart, to feel compassion and empathy for others. And in other words, a true god. Afterwards, Kratos wakes up Atreus and tells him that it is time. Also, at this time before Ragnarok, Kratos has come to the conclusion that he's the one that needs to be their leader. The leader that Tyr was supposed to be, altering what they had seen in the mural. And when they go into the temple, they all address him as general. And shortly after, a badass speech is had with Kratos. I know I'm letting a lot of scenes play out during the last part of the game, but this is when most of the important things are said. Also, it's just really cool. I came to these lands to escape my past, to start a new life. I can hide no longer. I do not want this war. We have suffered enough. Prophecy did not lead us here, nor will it win this battle. Wars are won by those that are willing to sacrifice everything. If that is the cost of vengeance, so be it. Odin has taken so much from us already. The realms have suffered enough. No matter the cost. This ends today. If going out in a blaze of glory means that Odin burns too, might as well be. A big fat smile on my face. Brock. The amount of adrenaline and testosterone running through my body after that speech was, <laughs> it was impactful and that moment is something I'll remember for the rest of my life, no doubt. It has the same impact of Avengers Endgame where everyone comes out of the portal to defeat Thanos. In fact, I think this game pulled it off miles better. As everyone goes through the portal into Asgard, war is started. All of the realms are going to defeat Odin, and throughout this level, it is badassery at its finest, just totally annihilating enemies. But over time, you see the portal of the realms collapsing, causing armies not to be able to fight shutting down Ragnarok, so the mission stands to get rid of Asgard's defenses. Also, during this level, you get to see Gormengander fight Odin, the famous battle that was told in the first game where the giant serpent got sent back in time. I thought the shit was cool, tying up the story that was previously told. My only question is, what happened to old Yormi? It was like, never stated what happened to him. Though, Cory Barlog himself stated, I think on Twitter, that his story will be told later, so I can't critique this too much since it seems like they already had plans for him in the next game, hopefully. We then get to the portal that leads into Svartal Fine, since the dwarves haven't arrived yet, and as we get close to the portal, it seems like Sindri is the only one who had come. This is worrisome for everyone, but Sindri states that no more dwarves need to die needless deaths in the name of Odin. 
He says that he has what he needs, so we push forward. We then get to a cutscene where Ragnarok finally shows up with his big ass head. As we see though, the Asgard defenses are pushing him back. This causes Sindri to put something down and hammer it, which causes the defenses to crumble, letting Ragnarok unfold. Then an important scene happens. I didn't want this. No. Close your heart to it. Close your heart. Who are they? My guardians. Odin took them in. They shouldn't be here. They're not soldiers. Odin put them in our path to die. It's war. Wars are won. By those who are willing to sacrifice. Everything. What are you doing? Son, listen closely. You feel their pain because that is who you are. And you must never sacrifice that. Never. Not for anyone. I was wrong, Atreus. I was wrong. Open your heart. Open your heart to their suffering. That is your mother's wish. And mine as well. Today, sir. Today. We will be better. But... What can we do? See the size of that thing? I think we're gonna win. Come in. If they don't kill us first. Why have you stopped? Ragnarok is here. We finally have Odin right where we We will stop Odin. But we did not come to sacrifice the innocent. We will breach the wall at Rimto's flaw. With what army? Atreus and I will be enough. That's suicide. It may be. But we will die seeking justice, not vengeance. Can that weapon break open the flaw? Only one way to find out. You three. Get those people to safety wherever you can find it. We'll see if done. Frey and I will do what we can to slow Ragnarok. He was not mindless before. See if he will listen to reason. <laughs> Odin will not get away. If he does, so help me. I know. Valky! Ah! No! No! Protect him! I will help those that are trapped and meet you at the fall. Go! Go, Atreus! As you can see, Kratos has finally changed into a better god, understanding that opening your heart to people suffering and helping them is what being a god is all about. Fulfilling Faye's wish, putting that in Atreus's mind changes everything. Atreus can finally be himself. Atreus can finally be who he wants to be. So afterwards, we now play as Atreus alongside Sindri, trying to get to the flaw of the wall. Through this whole section, there is some much needed back and forth between Sindri. Sindri clearly isn't in a position to forgive anyone or anything, even when Atreus saves him from certain death. Sindri doesn't give a thank you. He is still hurt over the fact of Brock dying and is only doing this in the name of revenge, the same as old Kratos. The two eventually get to a part where they encounter Thrud, who is accusing Atreus of lying, and I love how they tie this plot point up. A lot of games would have just ignored this, forgot about it, leaving a lot to be desired, but this game really hammers home the point of change. After the two argue, Mommy Sif comes out with Skjoldir and says that everything Atreus is saying is true about Odin, how he just uses people for the means of personal gain. Atreus then goes over to see if Skjoldir is okay. Atreus mentions something important that even if he owes 
owes Odin, it doesn't mean that he owes him his death. Sif and Thrud have a moment with each other and then join Atreus and Kratos on their journey to get to Odin. But before that, Sindri breaks down the flaw of the wall so everyone can push forward, stating that his work is now done. After killing some enemies, we then see Freyr come to us, stating that the Ragnarok beast didn't want to listen. After he says this, though, we see the World Serpent and Thor make it out. You actually get to see the giant snake be sent back in time by Thor because he hit him so hard. This was amazing, and I'm glad they included this in the game rather than just explain it without showing that the snake was gone. Thor then comes in, crashing into Kratos. Thrud tries to stop her father, but nothing works. Kratos tells Atreus and everyone else to leave that this was Kratos' battle. After an intense boss battle that one, remember for a long time, Thor and Kratos finally have a heart-to-heart -heart about parenthood. Who would have thought? <laughs> Thor says that he doesn't want Kratos to even touch Thrud, but Kratos says that he won't hurt her. She's Atreus' friend, and he trusts Atreus' judgment. After Kratos says this, he sheathes his axe and tells Thor that they must be better. They need to change. Thor states that they are destroyers. Kratos says no more. Solidifying the fact that Kratos has done a 180. He's no longer the man that blindly destroys in the name of revenge. He's a man with a son and he wants to protect at all costs. He has grown to become a good father. He's become a role model and a beacon of hope for the people in the realms. He cements this by not attacking Thor, saying that they need to change for the sake of their children. This causes Thor to back down and not attack, but all of a sudden, Owen comes out of nowhere. He asks Thor why on earth isn't he trying to kill Kratos. Thor says no more and drops his hammer, leaning into what Kratos had told him, to be better for their children. With Thrun and Atreus coming out of nowhere, Owen has enough of it and stabs Thor, killing him, willing to kill his own son for his own gain. This causes Thrud to scream in horror. Odin tries to manipulate her by saying this was caused by Atreus and Kratos, but since she witnessed Odin kill her father, she rushes after him. But unfortunately, Odin takes Thor's hammer and yeets through to cross the map. This causes a boss fight to occur that, in all honesty, was worse than Thor's for some reason. I wish they could have made this more epic. In all honesty, this fight was just way too fucking easy. After we kick his ass the first time, Odin traps us with some magic, but Freya comes and saves us. She gets the noose we found earlier, while talking to the Norns, and strangles Odin. She goes on a way too long of a speech, though, saying that he needs to bow to his queen and shit. If only they would have fucking done something during this time so he wouldn't have escaped. Well... He escapes, so nothing we can do about it now. Odin slams the ground, sending everyone down into a sex dungeon that has the knowledge crack that Atreus was trying to decipher with the mask. A scene plays out, though, that involves Atreus taking on the mask because he sees the green crack. Odin comes out and tries to coerce him to put on the mask and find out what the knowledge is. Odin says that this is what Groa's prophecy was, saying that Loki was the one that was meant to put on the mask. I'm not sure if this is true or not, but nonetheless, Kratos comes out and tells Atreus that it's his call to make, trusting him to do the right thing. And after hearing this, Atreus then breaks the mask sending Odin to a huge bitch fit and another section of a boss fight that is way too fucking easy. After some cool fucking quick time events though, a cutscene plays that I would like to show. This was our chance, Loki. I could have had my answers. I could have learned the truth. You took that away from me. I could have made things better. We could have made the Nine Realms better. This was never about the realms or me. It was about you! You destroyed everything. My home, my family, my kingdom! You did those things! Your choices! You killed your own son! It wasn't my choice. I had no choice. There's always a choice! You have to stop. You can choose to be better. No, I can't. I have to know what happens next. I will never stop. Why'd you have to say that? Sofna, Apfra, Desu. Sofna, Hethan. Sofna. Sofna. I swore I would never rob from you the choice between life and death.
I have waited so long for this moment. And now that I'm here, I don't need this to make me whole. We stopped his madness. That's all that matters. So the prophecy did come true in a different way. Because of the actions of Atreus and Kratos, the mural didn't lead to the death of Kratos. The person on the mural ended up being Odin instead, with the soul being sucked into the marble. And I love this so much because not only does Kratos give the choice to Freya about his death, but she also has a character change. He chooses to be better. He chooses to understand that revenge isn't going to make her whole again. Then on the other spectrum, Sindri chooses revenge because he thinks that it will make everything better in the name of Brock. I love how they incorporated at least one character that changed in another direction. This way, they still have consequences to the actions of other characters. It's amazing. Not to mention the sacrifice of Freyr and Freya making the decision that it was Freyr's choice between life and death. The same thing that Kratos had told her. Everything connects in the scene and it was peak storytelling. I really don't think anything is like it in gaming. And after waking up from being knocked out, the player goes on one last walk with Atreus, meeting up with characters you met along the way. You talk with the shield mains about how many people got out safely, you talk with Thrud and Mommy Sif about their loss of Thor, and how they are thankful that Atreus helped them see the real Odin. You talk with Skjoldir about the Midgardian people and if everyone is okay everyone is safe. We talk with Lunda about Freya and giving remembrance to him. You meet with Freya and she tells us that she's proud of the man Atreus has become. She has become a mom figure to him throughout these games and it's heart-wrenching to see her hug Atreus the way she did. Oh my god. One of the more emotional meetups was with Mimir. Atreus tells him that he was essentially a second dad. Mimir even tells Atreus that he loves him. I can't anymore. This game is so emotional. And finally, you meet Angerboda and Fenrir. They both have a moment of thanks. Angerboda comes full circle and explains that destiny is now something that she can write herself. I mean, considering she literally saved everyone from certain deaths, she has for sure succeeded in that goal. Angerboda then says something to Atreus, stating that Atreus hasn't told Kratos something yet about the giants. All of a sudden, Kratos walks in and is awkward as hell because... Atre Atreus was trying to riz up Angerboda, though Angerboda says that she has a surprise for the both of them, so they walk. And during this walk, Kratos finishes the story with Atreus, saying that the man that called upon death asked death to put the logs back on his back. He wanted to live again. If you kind of listen closely, this is very much similar to Kratos of his story. We eventually get to another giant shrine. Kratos opens it up and it reveals their entire journey so far. Faye purposely took down Loki's shrine so the two wouldn't know their fate, so they can write their own path. The sole thing caused the survival of Kratos, and Atreus is not staying in Asgard. The two have bonded so closely because of her actions, or everyone's actions. Atreus then tells Kratos about the giants and what he's needed to do. He tells him that it is his responsibility to do so and no one else's, leaving the only option being Atreus running off and doing what he thinks is best. Kratos then says some emotional things to Atreus, saying if it frightens Atreus, then he must do so. Fully trusting Atreus to forge his own path for good, I'm going to let the rest of this cutscene play out. Like you taught me. Yeah. We survived today because of your choices. Who to trust? Who to call friend? Son, you are ready. Remember our promise. Loki will go. Atreus. Atreus remains. Thank 
care of everyone. What did you see in there, brother? to it. Kratos is finally worshipped in the end by his people. After years of destruction, misery, and pain, the God of War has finally written a path of good to help the people in need and to become better. His crying is what sealed it for me. You can clearly see that this is what he had always wanted. When Odin said that he had never felt the love of people worshipping him, well, now he finally has a path to know that feeling. Just a, an amazing finish to an amazing story. A story that I'm going to remember for a long, long, 
long time. Wow is all I can say. And finally, there is a secret ending that I would like to touch on. If you head down to Svartalfheim after talking with Lunda in Midgard, you can see off Brock at a funeral. It's just sad as fuck, but also at the same time, a good way to cap off the sequel. This will be the final cutscene I'll show in the critique. It's bigger the more you take away.
So going into the combat and world, I'm going to go off script because I just have a list of things I just want to cover right now. So let's get into it. So for the axe gameplay, the Leviathan axe, it's a lot more slower paced gameplay, but heavy damage. Um, and with that, it has an elemental effect of ice. Of course, you guys know that from the previous game. And if you guys go into the menus where you can upgrade the skill tree, you can get certain moves, certain abilities and stuff like that. Uh, this one, I believe, is just very good for just heavy damage. If you go one on one with a boss, I use it the most just because the most damage output out of all the weapons, in my opinion, and I upgraded it fully upgraded did <laughs> I upgraded it fully although I use it the most it is my least favorite weapon my favorite weapon right now is the spear and the reason is is because you have a certain amount of spears that you can throw at enemies and then just detonate them whenever you feel like it and it does uh, pretty good damage especially on bosses and enemies that you just kind of want to take out like the cannon fodder so to speak has the same like skill tree as any other weapons you can uh, add more moves to it add more abilities and stuff like that one of my favorite abilities is when you throw the uh, the spear into the air and like a thousand spears come crashing down and I really use this in boss fights because it damages them a lot and it stuns them and for your kind of crowd control in my opinion what I used it for also this was the weapon I used the most was the blades of chaos just because well one it's really cool and two I found it stuns enemies more often than not and I got more accustomed to the button layout and combos with the blades of chaos than any other weapon going off to the next part of the list is your health and rage in order to upgrade those you have to go around the world and find chests and complete certain puzzles uh, you guys know this from the last game and you get app the apple or the horn it progressively you need to get more and more horns or apples in order to upgrade your uh your health and rage so for example if i got one apple it was my first time it upgrades my health same with the horn but the next time i need to do it i need to get two and then the next i need three the next i need four so forth so it's it's pretty balanced though i do wish there was more scattered around around the world I, I mean i don't know it's just for me i'm a person that kind of straight lines the the story uh just because i kind of want to get it done and that's what i like the most and i feel like when i do side quests I get disappointed a lot. I don't know. I just wish they scattered this more around the world. So next is your armor upgrades. If you go into, uh, if you press the touchpad and go into the menu, you can see uh, you have different armors that have different abilities with your defense, with your damage output, and with your uh, valor, which is your health and, and so forth. Uh, you need to, on a harder difficulties, you really need to like pick out what you want to uh, have first, which is your defense or your attack. And even some armors have certain abilities as well. So you need to keep a lookout on that. You can also upgrade them at Sindri's workshop um you can craft new uh items with kind of materials you found around the world uh, which you find uh from chest killing boss battles what i found though is with armor more often than not you're just going to stick to one armor set and you're not going to branch out so what i recommend you guys do is when you're starting out on your like second or third playthrough wait to kind of feel everything out every armor out and then start upgrading it uh, just because it kind of lets you see everything if you know what I mean. For the skill tree, Kratos and Atreus and Freya have their own skill trees. Uh, Kratos is probably the, the one that's most in depth. You have a skill tree for your Leviathan Axe. You have a skill tree for Blades of Chaos. Your, uh, yeah, one for the spear um, and so forth. I said that with my weapon kind of analysis thing that I have asked. <laughs> I found this pretty lackluster. I wish there was more options for just Kratos himself with certain abilities. I know that comes with like, the armor sets and so forth, but I do wish there was like maybe upgrades to your just fists and shields and, and so forth. So there's more they can could have done with Kratos, but in regards to Freya and Atreus, I found those pretty good just because you don't play them a lot. They're mostly just your companions. And when you upgrade the stuff when they're your companions instead of playing as them, it works pretty good. So going into Atreus gameplay, I found Atreus gameplay to be quite fun, more fun than I would have thought. But the thing is, for me at least, every time I went to Atreus, uh, Atreus's point of view within the story, I kind of found myself wishing I was Kratos. Like, I don't know. Like, I feel like they kind of did it a little too much. Maybe if they would have taken away like one sequence where you're Atreus and just put you in Kratos' shoes, that would have been good. But I feel like 
there was just a tad bit too much. Um, even though it's fun, it's just not as flushed out as Kratos is. And I found myself like doing the same animation when you press R3 against an enemy. That you only have like two animations and it kind of gets boring over time. Nothing is cool anymore. Like sure, yeah, he's faster. It's just not fun after a while. So I don't know, Kratos is, is I, f I find him more fun. I wish there was more sequences with him, especially with the anger Boda stuff. It, it should not have been that long. They should have cut it up into pieces. Um, but although I do see where people can like it. And going into that was with your companions, you have Freya and Atreus most of the time that even you can upgrade. There's some instances where you have Sindri and Brock, but they're, I don't consider them companions. It's mostly just Freya and Atreus. I found Freya is more interesting to be around when you're your companion companion but that's after the fact like they only have you with Freya after the story and after playing the story I just found her more interesting but within the story with uh, Atreus I found it good for story purposes but for gameplay purposes I definitely like Freya more. So for looting, there's not much looting going on. You just pick a pack silver and you go to certain chests that are pretty easy to get to. It's not in depth at all. You will probably find yourself looting every single chest in the realms pretty quickly when you go through levels um, and side quests. So it's nothing that you need to really pay attention to. You're probably just going to run into it and just start looting anyway. So I'm just going to go over this briefly. So for puzzles, puzzles are, how can I say this? Annoying. <laughs> I found myself kind of screaming at my screen because like either one, one of my companions will just blurt something out and help me complete the puzzle in like two seconds. Or on the other hand, just the puzzle is just so dull to the point where it's like, it's not a puzzle anymore. So either one, they need to buff the puzzles pretty good or two, just get rid of it and just have it a linear storyline to find other ways to slow down the player. They're just not my cup of tea. So for navigation in the realms, uh, you will have Yggdrasil seeds that you can travel to different realms and you go to different mystic gateways around said worlds. And with that, you have like side quests that go along with them. My favorite realm so far though is Jotunheim, just because of how beautiful it is or as Asgard, but after you complete the game, I don't think you can go to Asgard, so that one's redundant. So yeah, realm travel is pretty cool. It's a step forward from the last game where you can only travel to certain realms. So going to all of them, or at least most of them, is a nice change. So when it comes to side quests, I'm going to talk about how they feel apart of the overall narrative. And let me say it's mostly connected in some side quests. There's like small side quests where you have to talk to a certain ghost like you did in the last game. There's side quests where they're very much connected with the narrative uh, level. Like I said, with Bierger, uh, when he sacrificed himself, I don't know why he did, but when he did, there's a side quest that you have to follow this pig thing. And when you follow, you go into the secret like area. That's a side quest and it's fun fucking massive and it's amazing. There's another side quest where you can help uh, Freya uh, with her marriage stuff. I mean, they're they're pretty in depth and you can find out a lot about characters. What I recommend though, cause I didn't do this on my first playthrough, is go through side quests before ending the overall narrative of the game because Atreus, you know, leaves. So after the game, you don't get Atreus back. There's some dialogue that you probably want to hear with him. Like for instance, when you're in, uh, I believe it was the home of the elves, Alfheim, there is a mission where you have to free some like jellyfish things and along that it's very much father son bonding time that you really need to play and when you play all of those the ending is going to be a lot more emotional for you so I, I recommend doing those but there are some side quests that you can probably just skip like the ones I said the ghost one and uh, kind of like the boss fight ones unless you're like a dark souls fiend and you like boss fights, then go after those. And each realm has different side quests that go along with it, that go along with like the environment and stuff like that. Like Vanaheim has a lot of uh, like hunting and stuff like that. Vanaheim's also the place where you can go to the secret uh, area and so forth. I found Vanaheim has my two favorite uh, side quests, um, and I'm gonna talk about my favorite side quests right now. One is the Bierger one where you can go and find a whole new like area to explore. My other favorite is when Freya goes and gets her marriage stuff, even though the combat in that is very dull. I do like the area it shows you. And my next favorite one that's also in uh, 
Vanaheim is when <laughs> you have to fetch Lunda's orb and it ends up being a dog toy. <laughs> I found that like really funny and I mean you can also get her armor along the way that you can craft but all it it just makes it seem like it's the serious side quest but in all reality it's just a toy for her like pig <laughs> so I don't know I just found that funny and the rewards you get from side questing like I said sometimes you can get like armor pieces with like Lunda you can get different crafting materials that you wouldn't find anywhere else you can uh, get certain abilities and so forth. And within those side quests, there's like hidden chests where you can upgrade your health and so forth. So I do recommend getting those early on before the end of the game. And don't be like me where you just fucking straight shot the story the first time. And these, the length, lastly, the length of these side quests are pretty decent. I found myself completing them within 10 to 15 minutes if you like straight shot it and uh, go fast and not worry about the dialogue that the characters are saying along the way. If you are caring about the dialogue, which I did my second time, I would say it's about like 20, 25 minutes around there. Um, well, also depending on your difficulty. So if you're on like hard difficulty, it's probably gonna take you a while. So <laughs> yeah, that's gonna do it for the side quests. Side quests overall, I love them. Um, there is a couple that I wish were a little bit better, but overall, I think they were a nice addition to the game, uh, kind of fleshing them out and so forth. Like I have stated, God of War Ragnarok is now one of my favorite games of all time from a narrative point of view. No other story has made me cry as much as this game. The reversals of characters, the lessons taught, the saying goodbye to Atreus, and walking the path of fatherhood. This game has taught me more lessons than any other media I have witnessed, and I applaud the writers for what they did here. This was a once in a lifetime game for me and I will cherish it forever. Even with the questionable decisions of characters that I didn't agree with, the compass not working properly, and the slow pacing of the game at times, this game is still something that I will play all over again for years to come. So with that comes the raking. So let's go over them. The very bottom is not even close. This means the game is nowhere near the level of a masterpiece and has a lot it needs to work on. Next is it has potential. This means with a couple of fixes, with patches, some tweaks to the writing, and possible DLC, this game could be amazing. The second highest is amazing. This means the game has some problems, but it was still a great game nonetheless and is a flagship title. Lastly, the highest is masterpiece. This means the game is a of all else, a Hall of Fame game and solidifying itself as one of the greatest ever made. So, what is my ranking for God of War Ragnarok? It's amazing. The game is, and I'm not kidding, on the cusp of becoming a masterpiece. With just a couple of fixes with dialogue and characters, getting rid of characters blurting out answers to a puzzle, and fixing the compass, this game could be a masterpiece. And with that being said, the game is still a top three game of all time for me. I love this game with all my heart, but I still recognize its flaws and areas. So hopefully you guys can understand that and maybe feel the same way. Regardless, this is the end of the critique. Please like and subscribe. Give me some constructive criticism down below and tell me if there's anything you want me to fix in the next critiques and I will take it into account. I hope you guys have an amazing day. Don't forget to go into the description and follow my Twitch and Twitter. I'll see you in the next one. Bye everyone.